with a public hearing on the town plan. This is a chance for anybody who has more comments or things that you think to be discussed later. My name is John Pemmental, uh, East Randolph, and since East Randolph has been put back in the town plan, um, has the town also reapplied for village designation for East Randolph, which is one of the requirements. It not only needs to appear in the plan, has an application been made to regain the, the village de uh, designation for East Randolph. Well, once the select board approves the plan, we can then apply for redesignation. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure that's part of, yeah. that, that's that's in process. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, George Holt, uh, just wanted to know from the select board if any action has been taken on the recommendations that I made at the first hearing uh, last month. Uh, I can review those recommendations if you like. Submit them. This one was in writing um, to Marty if that's easier. The We're taking action on item five tonight. Oh, on the plan, so. Okay. This is so the second my hearing. Before. Yeah, I'm aware. Sorry for it. Um, the, um, on page 28. Um, under the actions to implement policy B, um, a couple things. One is um, that the town plan refers to the East Randolph designation as if it is in place and we need to retain it, but it's actually lapsed and we need to reapply. So it's like just a matter of correction um, because there's no map in the map section for that. It would be probably more consistent to correct that to read reapply for um, as if it were in existence you would need to have the map in the map section so um, just a, a note um, probably my most significant comment is that I think that um, we talked about this before during the zoning the zoning rewrite removed the PUD section which I think applies in economic development as supporting fostering high quality development and redevelopment that strengthens the economy, respects the environment, and complements the community's larger goals. So I would recommend under actions to implement policy B to add, enable, or consider enabling PUDs or re-enabling PUDs to encourage creative development and redevelopment. There are already PUDs in town, so it creates a zoning challenge for those PUDs already in existence, and then there's no opportunity in the future to do creative redevelopment, especially when things are already under uh, permits or active permit 50 permits or have challenges, development challenges. Pages 64, 65. I would recommend under the chart on the top of page 65, changing the word subsidized to affordable because not all of those are subsidized. And um, there's a difference between those two terms. <coughs> and if you wish, I can add the things that are missing and correct those numbers if there's room in the draft for just a technical correction of the uh, list um, because we weren't. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm in the interest of this being at the end of the 
the process. I will say it's very from the others, except that there's some, I know there's also um, reference to Central Vermont Community um, about Capstone, which is the name changed. And so you want to update the name. It's the Central Vermont Community Action, and now it's Capstone. We will close the public hearing, move into the regular agenda. First is public to be heard. This is on anything that's not on the agenda. I think we had Sam. Are you here for public comment? I'm not on the town plan. No, no we're, we're now on to the meeting. Excuse me? We're on the meeting agenda now. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm here, uh, as the select board knows, I've written a, a letter with regards to the assessed values in the downtown business, business district. And I, uh, you know, Jay, my wife and I have been here since 1971. We've uh, taken a number of properties in the downtown area, such as 2 South Main Street, where Verizon used to be on the ground floor, and where we really have personally had that building vacant for the better part of 10 years. Um, as you all know, we, we bought the old Canadian uh, National Railway building, did a historic renovation on that building, and uh, we bought the Montague Golf Club as, it, as it, was, it was about to go out of business. And we bought the old co-op space at 24 Pleasant Street. And as you know, of course, we owned the Green Mountain Stock Farm in the Three Stallion Inn until recently, having sold it to the Brunswick School. I feel that the Assessed values in the downtown business, business district are inaccurate and not um, they're not where they should be, and they're not they're not anywhere close to what today's market values are. And I think that Randolph, with with a number of outsiders, professional real estate people in White River, Montpelier to Burlington, over to Rutland. They know that, that the assessed values are not accurate, and I think it's hurting the town's reputation. It's not making us look like we are running the town professionally. <coughs> And I think that my recommendation is that the assessed values be brought in line with what today's true market values are. So that is my request. I love this town. It's got a lot of stake. And I want the town to have nothing but the very best reputation. And I think that the town needs to address this issue <coughs> immediately. Next, we have the approval of the agenda. I'm sorry, I have it. Sure. My name is Brooke Dingle Dean. Um, I see that on your agenda, I'm not exactly sure what 
decision or recommendation exactly is being made, but I understand the select board has been asked by the Orange Southwest Supervisory or Orange Southwest School District to fill the vacancies um, on the school board for two of the positions from Randolph. Randolph has four representatives on an eight-member board at our school district. There are two members from Brookfield, two members from Braintree, and four from Randolph. After the August meeting, two members of the Randolph board, myself included, resigned from the board. I did so because the board is operating in a rogue manner against the law and is preventing uh, board members from obtaining evidence um, to review the actions of the superintendent. Okay, so before you go, the, oh, the public to be heard is for anything not on the agenda. I'm sorry? Public to be heard comment is for anything that's not on the agenda. Oh, well, I'm not staying, um, so if you don't mind entertaining my comments on this at this point, I would appreciate it because I don't have the opportunity to stay. I'm not sure how long the board meeting will be. So is that all right if I continue? Um, or we can, in our next item, in the, or in the approval of the agenda, we can move to the Oh, okay. So well, she'd be here for the whole conversation then. Sure. Versus I'd, be, I'd be happy to jumping. be here for the whole time or answer any questions work. that you folks might have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other public comment? So approval of the agenda. If I may ask the board to entertain that request, uh, we received a grant announcement today um, for a dry hydrant uh, request that we had submitted a few weeks ago. Um, because it was received today, we were not, not able to amend the agenda to include it. Um, if the board would like, we could include it as uh, an other business item. Or if the board would like, we could again entertain it for next month's meeting. It won't delay the process by much. Um, but I thought I would bring that option up to the board. Okay. So we have an agenda with two changes to it under new business, moving 5L to the top of new business and adding the dry hydrant grant to other business. We move that we approve the agenda with those changes. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Carries. <coughs> and we just have the consent calendar with our meeting minutes and the warrants. For some reason, I have to post that the meeting minutes. Did anybody else get on? <laughs> I just have the minutes from the public hearing. The warrants are the one that Wendy sent out. Right. Oh, no, I have the, yeah. I have the, I have the, I have the minutes from last. Just a replacement maybe. Oh, one was. I'm sorry. Yeah, hearing. one was a public hearing. Public hearing minutes from the last public hearing. Okay. 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 I move we approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Motion carries. And we'll go to new business uh, board vacancies for the Orange Southwest Supervisory District. So the OSSD board has not yet made any recommendations to the select board to consider. Um, according to state law, the select board uh, must be um, included in the selection process. Um, we have communicated with the OSS, OSSD board and their board leadership they have committed to advertising the vacancies that are available. And as soon as they have candidates for the vacancies, they will approach the select board, again, per state law, and ask for the select board's input into the process. But as of now, they're, as far as I'm aware, they may have only one candidate, but have not yet made any decisions on appointments. So who makes the, who recommends the candidate to us? Right, the, the exact wording, I don't have in front of me, but if I remember serves me correctly, the school board makes the appointment but has to consult with the select board of the town uh, whose representative, whose representatives they're appointed. 
So select the school board will gather candidates. They will then consult with the select board. Um, uh, and then the appointment will be made. But the exact language, I believe, reads that the school board makes the appointment with consultation of the select board. Okay. Adolfo, did you um, give us the statutory um, reference for that? Because in my knowledge, and I actually got on the statutes this morning to mm -hmm. double check because I was very unclear as to why the select board was being involved in this. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, the, the select board has no role. We're a separate governmental entity. Mm -hmm. It is the school board that fills its own vacancies and must do so within 30 days of the resignation. Correct. I don't have the language in front of me, but the language Again, from my memory, specifically states that you are correct in that the school board selects its members in consultation with the select board. Now, it doesn't say that the select board has to vote to approve the appointees, but it does say that the select board is consulted in the process. I'm all for the select board being involved because I think um, I much better trust the decision makers in this arena. Um, but I'm not aware of any statute that even um, requires a consultation with you folks. But if that's okay. how they're proceeding, thumbs up for me because I would I would um, welcome the select board's um, involvement in this because I think it's a very important decision that needs to be made. Um, if, if I can just mm -hmm. continue with the comments sure. I wanted to make. What is at stake here is the lawful operation of the school board, and that is not happening right now. The law is being violated. The select board was given a report by the superintendent um, that makes wild accusations, completely unsupported, conclusory statements. And the that was given to who? To that the was a, a, so under the governance process that the school board uh, follows, which is, which is called policy governance, there are um, policies that are enacted by the school board that give parameters for the um, authorization and um, decision-making authority that's delegated to the superintendent. And in uh, shouldering that responsibility, the superintendent must then report back whether or not he has complied with those delegations of authority. In, in policies. So every year, each policy that delegates authority to him is reported on, and it's done monthly. There are two policies that are reported because by the, by the end of the year, then the superintendent has covered all areas of his authority. So um, there were two reports that were submitted by the superintendent, and in some July retreat, not a real board meeting, Apparently the board, I was not there, but the board claims that they've made decisions in a non-public forum, changing the process of how they are going to be reviewing these reports under their policy governance. And they said instead of two board members going and <clears throat> verifying the information in the evidence book, which is if the superintendent says, I've done no wrong, he must prove that by having a, and it's traditionally been done, every single policy has its own binder of evidence, and those two board members who are assigned for each of the policies would go to the, off, the central office, read the report, and look at the evidence to um, ensure that the reporting that was done by the superintendent is accurate, verifiable, just like entities, um, school boards, select boards, towns, hire auditors. We don't just ask our chief financial officer, is there money in the bank? We say, is there money in the bank? Have you complied with our budget? And prove it to us. And the way that we prove it to us is we hire auditors to come in and verify the information. In the school board setting under these policies, it is the school board that must verify the evidence. They're the auditors. So at this July retreat, in secret, they apparently came to some decision that the whole board would review every policy. We would not send two delegates to look at the evidence and report back after they've looked at all the documentation. 
And you know, the evidence is I've complied with state statute because, let me give you an example, um, because any services or goods over the statutory uh, limit of $10,000, we didn't just hire someone, we sent out uh, for public requests for proposals. Here's the list of all the contracts that we put out to bid. And so then the board member can, sit, can see that if the superintendent says we complied with the law, they can actually verify that the law was complied with. It's like an audit. So at the August meeting, we had two reports. One was even sent in secret to us. It was not sent publicly, which is the way that these reports are supposed to happen. And I got sent this report, not knowing that this process was changed, with a, um, just from the superintendent, who sent it only to the board. And then the board, current board chair sent an email that said, all board members are going to review this policy. And I'm kind of scratching my head. And I'm like, OK, well, I better get my, myself over to the central office to look at the book to be prepared for Monday, one day away. Um, so I went and I emailed and said I would be there on Monday morning at 8, went to see the evidence. And the superintendent refused to allow me to see any evidence, claiming that the board chair said that the board members were not allowed to see the evidence. So I scratched my head again. Went to the board meeting that night. And unfortunately, the ORCA video for the board meeting on August, whatever the date was, I can't remember, the 10th or something like that. Uh, they had technical difficulties, so there is no public recording of what happened at that board meeting, wherein I explained that I had been not denied access to the evidence for some pretty wild accusations uh, that are very self-serving and that are now being um, redacted from the public view, claiming these are employee issues or employee performance issues, i.e. the superintendent's job performance. So at this meeting, I'm like, what are you people doing? You're voting on a report, and you have not verified the contents of the report. You're voting to accept something that says, I did a great job, but don't look at the evidence. It is not only concerning that these folks on this board don't want to see the evidence themselves, because it's, there's a conflict going on. There is a dispute. And I am told from representatives of the remaining board that they want peace, they do not want conflict, and they want this in the rearview mirror. So I explained to this board, I'm sorry, but conflict is part of your job description. It would be wonderful if we didn't have any disputes, any problems, but that's exactly what your job is. You are the, the court of last resort for students, parents, and community members, staff, administrators, teachers, support staff, to come to you to sit in judgment of how they have been treated through the system, if their due process rights have been protected by this board and by the administration, who often is uh, criticized that, that they did not treat someone fairly. And that's why they come up to the board on a quasi-judicial basis. We, as a board, would have to sit in judgment, just like sometimes you folks are in that, in that position as well. So what this all comes down to is the fact that because these folks don't want to do their job, because they don't want to have to deal with conflict, they are sticking their head in the sand and refusing to verify the reporting that's being done that satisfies our community, that the enormous authority that is delegated to our superintendent under policy governance is being uh, properly exercised. If you won't look at, if you're looking at a report that has little snippets of an email that the superintendent sent to somebody, and you don't see the whole email, you don't see what the school board's lawyer said in response to the superintendent's concerns in an email, how can one possibly assess and analyze whether or not the self-serving reporting that's being done is or is not accurate. 
I, as a result of this conversation and this board meeting, endeavored my utmost to try to explain to them, this is not rocket science. You can't stick your head in the sand. You must do your job. And not only are they not doing their job, but they are preventing others from doing their job with this pretense that now the whole board is reviewing a report. But when you don't allow a board member, myself, to, who said, I want to see the evidence, and the superintendent is allowed to hide that evidence from everybody, not just the community under some supposition that it's about his job performance, but from the board itself. We have two members of this board that just joined this board in March. Angelo Odato retired from Braintree, and um, uh, Randolph member, um, there was a contested um, election. They have no idea. Most of this reporting is from January and February, and from a very concerning uh, emergency, emergency situation that required um, protection of our, uh, of our school district and some very important decisions that had to be made. We have probably never faced a crisis like this, of this magnitude, before this past year. And it's about that very situation that the superintendent is not allowing anybody to see the evidence. So what we need to figure out is so, what role the Yeah, so I'm over. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get so lengthy. So please, if you are involved in this process of pointing someone, please pick someone who is willing to stand up for the law. I had to resign because I could not fulfill my oath of office and my oath of allegiance to the Vermont Constitution. I could not deliver due process of law, our most fundamental job and duty as a public official. Transparency and accountability is where it's at. And if you do not hang on to due process of law so that everyone is treated equally and fairly before the law, then we are lost. So please pick someone who you know isn't afraid of conflict, isn't going to stick their head in the sand, is going to demand evidence, and if they are not allowed to do their job, hopefully they will resign as well. Two of four Randolph board members are no longer on that board. And the two people who have resigned, I was a board member for 15 years, and I, I've been a lawyer in the state for 25 years. I had to resign because of their actions. Please pick someone who has the guts to stand up for what is right, who will protect our students, our staff, our other administrators and the board, because the board knows not what they do. Thank you. So for that, we're on hold, waiting for their action. To waiting for their action. Yeah. Them to bring candidates to us to give feedback on before they select this cooperation. Exactly. Usually. And they were proactive in approaching the, the town. They spoke with our uh, treasurer clerk choice. So notify her of the vacancies and notify her that at some point they would be uh, providing more information to the town so that we can become involved in the process. Well, do they know what they're doing to try to recruit people or are they just... They have been... The they've received one unsolicited uh, request to join the board. Uh, the position has yet to be advertised. It will be advertising the Herald and plan to perform advertisement in general for the vacancies. But they haven't done that yet, which is why they don't want to take action on the one person who's expressed interest because of articles that have been in the Herald. Okay. I thank you. <laughs> So for the town plan, um, we received a request to jazz up the cover some with some photos uh, and to add an introduction that had been written by Mr. Hall.
no adding objection. the introduction in the photo. I have no objection. No. Seems like it's perfectly appropriate to me. Okay. Two covers proposed that we need to get into the planning commission to do that. Sure. There's also a request um, that came in to Mr. Holt, which was removing some of the this is why we do the plan language, putting it into an appendix and reshaping um, chapter one. If we did that, it would then require us to send it back to the planning commission, get them to redraft it, and then bring it back to us to hold the hearings again. I'm not convinced that it makes such a big difference that it it's worth should go in maybe the next version. Mm -hmm. so we're, we're under some time constraints here tonight, right? We are. We need to get this to the Regional Planning Commission so they'll accept it and it can get uh, be adopted <coughs> completely to keep our downtown designation. And then to reapply for the village designation. Well, you're here. The, um, the search was done for large industrial wind. But that didn't come up. There's reference to wind on page 63, and it calls uh, small or larger commercial scale wind. I'm Any sorry, idea? I don't have my copy with me. Yeah, I, th I think the page numbers changed too since the last one we looked at. Yeah, of course they did. It's not the same section. I'm trying to. I didn't bring the copy. I'm trying to bounce. Language huh? version doesn't really matter. I did a search. I didn't attend the court. I didn't attend the court. I didn't attend the court. Oh, whoops. I didn't mind. It's on my computer. How do you look at the front? Oh, you got it here. I got it. Huh? I don't know where I left. Oh, yeah, my only comment on that was, you know, big wind is dead in Vermont, basically, so it, it just wasn't reflective of the reality of what's happening in Vermont. This is not any, um, anything of significance. Um, you should not worry about either needing to pull it out or whatever at this point. Um, and then um, I think there was a plan with the Planning Commission to move forward in the next year or two uh, to get the energy um, right. certification. So I, these are just minor details. Remember, the town plan's not a regulatory document, so you know the, the level of uh, minutia in this is really not critical um, because you're not using it as a document. I wouldn't worry about the comments I was making. I was just trying to clean it up and make a few less of corrections. Thanks. The comments to, tonight, the, um, the PUD and that being not included, we would want that to go back to the Planning Commission because I think that played into some of their zoning and changing stuff. So I don't know if we want to put it in here without consulting them. The updating the list on page 65 to change the title to affordable and correct the list. Um, I think that's the type of thing that probably Marty can do. It would have no bearing really on anything in the plan. So you want to send those to her. 
that would be good. Is there anything else that people have heard seen? These are the ones I have. So can I just a comment that? So if um, I think just as a recommendation in the future the there um, the, especially the organizations that are mentioned specifically in the plan, it would be great to reach out to them because we could have provided this and it would have been right. And it, it, it's clearly a lot of old data that wasn't updated and no one has that. And I don't think other housing groups or other civic organizations were necessarily reached out to and it would probably make the town, the town planning easier for people and less comments at the end. Um, I did mention the PD stuff on uh, the locations and I'm not sure. Know, you know where it is, but I think it's important in that we have existing PUDs and there is currently no mention of them anymore in the zoning document, which I think is a problem. And um, and I think it, it is also an opportunity to put it back in. So I, I can go back to the planning commission and talk about a zoning amendment as we had discussed before, but the town plan and the zoning document are supposed to be in performance. It's not mentioned specifically, but I think it's in keeping with some of the language in here. So there will be updates to this because they can see under your planning and whatnot. Okay. So it could be yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't make the earlier meetings, but it's probably a better place to catch it so they have a chance to talk about it and yeah. why it came out and, okay. and what their thoughts were. I'm sorry, but I didn't catch your name. Oh, Julie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we can adopt this tonight and then take get some of these um, changes and give them back to the Planning Commission for consideration for a new addition, which will be in the future. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can go to the RPC and get on their agenda. Yeah. And hopefully be adopted right off by so October or something, 10. Well, I 13. think we were able to get it onto their September 26th agenda. So we uh, they scrambled a little bit to help us and we're working that out on their end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. make a motion to accept it? So moved. We're going to include the preface by Mr. Holt. Yes, with the changes that we just discussed, right? Yeah, yeah that's what I said. That's what I motioned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> second. second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We have the representative here from Casella. We do. We have John Skates here, who's been very proactive in keeping local communications with the town. Um, you know, I've become fast friends and I've become a baseball teammate at some point. So. John, come on. Thank you. <laughs> How are you today? Good. Thank you for having me. Should I just stand here or I can sit over here? Yeah. Wherever you like me. Bye. I'm in the trash business, so if you <laughs> smell something, like I'll, I'll go back over here. Um, <laughs> would it be okay if I passed out a little sure. bit of information? Okay. Yeah. And I have five copies, so I'll be without one oh, there's only since one. he showed up. Cool. Um, I'll be as efficient as possible. My goal here is to give you two pieces of information and then one request. Um, and, then and then after, I'd be happy to address any questions you have of any nature on the transfer station or the industry or um, there was a document that, that was released about uh, legislative changes regarding uh, transfer recycling. Did I, miss, did I miss you with this? Here you go. Um, so thank you for having me tonight, and I wanted to let you know about a change in the recycling industry. Uh, this is a nationwide news. If you look on the, the big media, you'll find that uh, involved in the in the trade disputes with China, uh, recycling actually is involved. Uh, we send a lot of recyclable material, not only across the nation but overseas as well. And uh, mixed paper, particularly, has been subject to. Uh, basically not being accepted in China. So lots and lots of tons, uh, millions of tons from the United States have been backed up into the States, which has reduced the value to basically nothing. 
for mixed paper. Um, so therefore, bundled recycling services are more expensive to process, long story short. Uh, what that means is that, and, and you'll see from the document you have in, in the front the document that I gave you, that the state is acknowledging, ANR is acknowledging that this is happening. Uh, they're going to continue talking about how we can improve the way the state looks at recycling. We're going to keep it around. It's something that Vermonters believe in. Uh, Casella was offering uh, recycling um, before I was involved in the company. Um, so it's going to continue. And this doesn't threaten the, the services that we want to provide. What, what it does is it's going to affect the cost. Um, but it's not, it's not going to make it so that it's as much as trash by any means. So I'll put that in context for you. Um, and I'll get, I'll get to that as we go, but I just wanted to let you know that the recycling cost has increased. Um, the second piece on here is legislative changes. And right after this, after the front two pages, there is a document with, which outlines the, uh, the changes that involve transfer stations. Uh, particularly, recycling since, 2000, since the law of 2012, the universal recycling law, recycling has been bundled into the, the cost, into the price of a trash bag. So you go to a transfer station, you want to drop off trash and recycling, you typically only pay for the trash bag, and then the recycling would be for free. And the way that's written into the law is that the price of trash would carry the cost of the recycling service. And what has been changed since uh, the legislature left <coughs> is that those two charges no longer have to be bundled for transfer stations. And this is a good thing, particularly for for bag drop-offs and transfer stations, transfer stations like Randolph, because what happens is people that are bringing trash and recycling are having are having to more or less subsidize uh, through the cost of the trash uh, people that are only bringing recycling to the transfer station. So the town owns the property, we manage it, we set the prices so that we don't have to pass along costs for the service to town residents through taxes. So the charges that generate generators of trash and recycling, uh, the, the, what they pay at the transfer station supports that whole operation, meaning no taxes from that trash service, right? Um, but there is a stress on the system when people are allowed to bring just recycling and not leave revenue with that transfer station. So this law has undone that piece of the, of the legislation which says that you can charge for trash and recycling now independently. And so the third piece is, I wanted to come to you with this information. Um, this is kind of a wrapped up shorter version than I'm used to giving. But the, uh, I wanted to post that we intended to separate the charges. Uh, and we wanted to do that in about a month. We like to give 30 days heads up so that people can have the conversations, why it's happening. Our attendants are very, uh, very adept at handling people's concerns about why the changes are happening. Um, they can field questions. It gives it time for people to come back to a board meeting if it, if it comes to that level where we can address what concerns there might be. Um, and the last piece that I gave you was the intended changes in prices. So if you look at the, the current, I gave you a current price list um, on the last two pages and a proposed price list. And what the going rate for recycling at, at the drop-offs throughout Vermont right now is, is about $1.50 for a 30 gallon barrel. And then for every incremental 15 gallons, it would be 75 cents. So your typical 30 gallon garage barrel would be about $1.50 in recycling. And to offset that, because trash, the trash bags have been carrying that cost this whole time for the last three years, the trash prices you'll see in the proposed list have come down to offset it. In the past, I think the board has approved the rates. So, yeah, I brought this to you because I wanted to make sure you understood that this is kind of an odd scenario. It's not just a, hey, life is getting more expensive to live here, so here's more money to, here's more, more cost. Uh, this is a little more of a story behind it, why we're, we're going to be putting a cost into recycling but lowering the price of the bag of trash. And that's in why we would do that. So, um, in order to do that, uh, yeah, I'd have to come to get approval from the board. Um, I seek your approval, but first I want to just make sure if you had any questions or concerns about why we're doing it or if it's going to be the best option for your residents. I wanted to make sure we talked about those openly. Any questions? 
And with that, yeah, that's that's what I had to bring you today. With the uh, change in in uh, money being paid for mixed paper, are you going to change your handling of that and actually separate it out so you separate the lower cost or lower revenue generating uh, materials from the higher generating? I know that's being done in southern New Hampshire where very successfully where they're managing their revenue mm -hmm. uh, pretty efficiently to store the uh, materials that aren't uh, as high value as the others. So um, in Vermont, with the, law, with the universal recycling law, it's a great question if you didn't hear it. It's, can we start to look at pieces of what's, what parts of recycling are less, are less value? Can we separate those from the recycling stream so that we don't have to pay such a high so pay a price? for recycling, maybe it would even pay for itself because the value of the material would be such that we wouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, glass and paper are currently those that cost money to get rid of, uh, but the Vermont law is that those materials are banned from the landfill, so they're still in, they're still gonna have to be managed, and unfortunately <laughs> stockpiling them, uh, nobody's gonna take them without, uh, there's nothing that we can really do with them in the state uh, such that we would be able to create a second, a second stream for that recycling material. Um, not, not that this is a permanent answer to your question because recycling is a very fluid concept. What materials go in and how are those handled? Where are the end markets for those materials? Um, so we're looking for options and usually those options mm -hmm. happen on a, on a larger volume scale versus at the local place because it's, we have a very efficient process for collecting it easily as a combined recycling stream and then when it gets taken in a truck to the MRF, uh, it's, it's efficient at getting that separated there uh, where it's then sold off in its commodity value. Um, but right now, that's, that, hasn't, that hasn't changed the infrastructure yet. But if there's more strain on the system, like another, like another one of the like plastics, if that becomes uh, less, less value on the end, then it, it could put more pressure on the system. But Vermont's overall pretty rigid in how the law is written, and it doesn't change as quick as the marketplace changes on these commodity values. But does that answer your question? Mostly, yeah. Okay. If I can clear up anything, let me know. If you have to. How often does it change? When's the last time it changed? I think we get a contract annually, don't we? Yeah, but we didn't. The prices haven't been adjusted for a while. No. They were. They should have been adjusted. Uh, the trash went up, I believe, fifty cents about four months ago because this this effect mm -hmm. was happening. Hmm. No. Um, not true. I don't, we didn't receive a notice for that. We didn't. Prices it's have gone up at the transfer change. station, but I don't think we approved it. Was changing. Was changing. Yeah. 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 We didn't receive. I don't remember receiving a notice for that. I would Your own thing says it's four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is, these are, aren't these the new, the proposed? The, current, the current one. The current one. So there's the current oh. one there. Oh, and then that's see. what they're, what they're saying is that's not the rate that's the actually current. being charged at the transportation. So that's current. the well, current rate we well, have. The current rate here says 550, and that's what I paid last time I was at the transfer station. Yeah. Yeah. I'm but that, that went up recently, yes. but I don't think the select board approved that increase. I haven't seen it for over a year. Is that something? I'll have to check through our letters, because I mean, at, at minimum, we would send a letter to, like, Mel in the past, would then, Mel would have been the one that we sent the letter to. Mm -hmm. I know our agreement says that rates are allowed, but yeah. we have to receive notice. And I don't know. Yeah. Why don't, I, why don't we? Yeah, I'll look into okay. the history of <coughs> what kind of notice we've done for that and make sure. But, Anybody have but that, that change or where it's at now <coughs> compensates for what, uh, so it was ever since about last October, the end of last year, when the recycling industry was changing to what I was talking about. So we were a good 10 months into this, um, which is why that rate changed by about 50 cents in the trash to cover that recycling charge, which is also why the proposed changes that you see don't have another increase for to cover it again. So the proposal is to now separate the charges, mm -hmm. not to increase to cover that first effect I was talking about, because we already did that. Any concerns with any rates? I guess not. So I guess the, um, the question is with the separation, paying separately for the recycling, once 
And I'm a little confused because the tariffs hadn't, hadn't taken place in 10 months ago, right? So I would assume it's more of a marketplace of what China was consuming, not a tariff issue. Right. Don't know. Right. It's not um, a tariff issue. But, but, but say there's a demand on that. I mean, is the intention that you're going to come back and reevaluate this and go back to the old charging for the bags only of trash and not for the recycler? Or, or what's the longevity of this approach? That I mean, is this for the year kind of thing? I understand they can do rate change during the year, but is it? Is the separation of trash to recycle intended for the year? Yes. Okay. The state law, but change some of it, it allows them to charge. Allows them, yeah. Recycling now. But if there's a high demand on, is that going to be kept as profit or yeah. prices reduce the consumers? <laughs> you know. I'll check. It. I do. I'll check into the contract, but as recycling, <laughs> and it hasn't been pretty for about five years. Recycling has been. Material has the, the value has been going down for about five years, um, so there hasn't been a lot of yeah. good news about money coming back, rebates about the value of the con of the, the recyclable content. But um, we'll have to check the contract because most are written such that if there is a value change, we can reduce the, we can change the prices. But that's either way. Right. Look back at the twelve months that just passed, and if it didn't make out as we assumed it would, uh, and that's for the town or for for. Uh, the company, then that's something we can take to talk about, and I, I expect to. So, I don't see this as I see the, the separation of the charges as being uh, from here on, okay, until other changes in the legislature were to come and put it back how it was. But the whether we charge one dollar fifty for thirty gallons or a dollar versus two dollars in the future will will depend on sure, global, understood. global changes. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Sure, you, you mentioned earlier that. There are folks who come to their transfer station with just recyclables, and so they're kind of getting a free ride. Do you have any figures on how that balances out? Like, what, how much sort of, what sort of what the level of unfairness is of people who are sort of, in a sense, taking advantage of that, that situation, taking their trash, you know, someplace else mm -hmm. and getting a lower rate, and then coming to the transfer station and getting rid of their recyclables for free? Um, anecdotally. I mean, my attendants know a lot of people. You might know my attendants, <laughs> Bob Nichols, and, uh, Stu Lafon. Mm -hmm. uh, they so you don't have any real. They data. know how. I don't have. So you don't have any real data. I, I don't have a survey of hey, did you did you get, did you pay for your trash somewhere else and bring your recycling mm -hmm. here? Because mm -hmm. um, that cause that brings in a lot of questions that I don't really I don't really want to put other companies on the spot. Mm -hmm. Well, it just seems like you're, you're proposing to make these changes and then we're paying part to alleviate this concern. But you're, so we're making this change, but it's not based upon any data, right? It's just gotcha. a, couple oh, of, a couple of guys who are saying, yeah, so a bunch of people seem to yeah. bring in their recyclers here and getting it for free. Yeah, it's, so in, I guess internally we have a method of, of looking at, well, per, uh, per revenue, how many tons of trash or how many tons of recycling are we bringing in? So we. We can understand kind of the scale of well, what's the expected traffic flow, revenue flow, and what's the balance of trash and recycling. Mm -hmm. And and Randolph is is one of the one of the drop off locations that we manage that has a higher than okay. higher than expected recycling tonnage rate per per trash or per dollar, um, such that. It's because we're more responsible than other towns. <laughs> Recycling. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I can't argue that. I can't argue that. What, what, I guess the, the point of this is that, is that by, by charging the trash at the price that, we, that it costs us to do the service, and by charging the recycling by what it costs to do the service, we're, we're being, I think, as fair as we possibly could be, that if you, if you value the service, we'll provide it. And it's it, it doesn't call into questions anything else about whether or not other haulers competitors are offering both services or just one or charging widths for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No yeah. questions asked. Yeah. So I think that and what that does it keeps Randolph out of the the limelight for any state intervention on are our practices at the transfer station um, fair? Right? Mm -hmm. They are. And so, they will promote recycling. And mm -hmm. It's still cheaper to recycle, so continue to recycle. Mm -hmm. And I hope those tons continue to stay where they are. Great. So that brings us to the other question, sure. which is um, at the transfer station, the attendants have these gigantic wads of cash, and it's completely cash. There's no receipts. How, how do you make sure that what we're paying for actually 
pays for the stuff that we're doing and doesn't wind up into other pockets along the way. Do I, how do I trust my attendance? Yeah. Well, es essentially, is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Um, so, I don't have any as particular reason not to trust them. It's just that it's an unusual, in this today day and age, it's kind of an unusual way yeah. of handling a financial yeah. transaction. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll look at that because I, I definitely don't want them walking around with wads of cash in their hand. It's not safe, first of all, uh, for them. Um, now that everybody knows. <laughs> well, it's not a big secret. I mean, anybody who goes to the sure. transfer station and pays for it, I see the attendants pull out. And I've had these conversations with my employees before. Big lot of the bills. Um, but the way we know that the money is right per the weight of the material that we're collecting is because we, we track, are we getting the dollars we expect for the amount of tonnage that we have? And so it's based on some assumptions about per bag, there's a, a certain amount of weight. Uh, expected mm -hmm. um, and so forth, but we can we can see which ones are outliers on any given week or any given day, mm -hmm. such that we would question: is there some is there something missing? Yeah, is it is cash probably, is probably. cash working uh, as far as? It, um, I mean, it works for me to pay in cash. I'm just it's just it's just it just raises a you know question. It's just easy to imagine some unscrupulous you know employee yeah. deciding that. Well, this $5 is just going to go into my pocket mm -hmm. instead of, you know, to my employer. Yeah, I would hope they... Which would, raises the cost for I'm, all of us. I'm right? not oblivious to the fact that yeah. that is a possibility. Uh, we do, uh, and at some point, and in some cases, I'm, I'm not letting out all my secrets about how we're capturing mm -hmm. all, the informa all the information to prevent such things, uh, i.e. we might use uh, cameras or uh, tracking other tracking systems. Um, but it is, it is a concern of ours, and we feel like we have it. We have it in a good place, okay. and we have very long-standing, uh, good-natured people. I think as well uh, mm -hmm. working in there. Great. So I guess my last question is in regards to, I mean, the recycling initiative. Right when it's free, people have probably a more better propensity to use the service. Now we start charging for it. You know, what is the? And and honestly, a trash bags cheaper. <laughs> Right. So, what's is there any studies out there? Have you guys considered the fact that the recycling may drop, or the recycling is going to end up in the trash bag? I know, I know, there's a law there, but yeah. what are, you guys aren't ripping through every bag, right? Yeah, we will. We'll, we're going to we're going to watch that, and it's going to take us probably two months to get a good sense of the data on that. Um, we put this into effect starting late July, and come up some other drops, some other bag drops. So, I think at the end of September, we'll have numbers to restart to see what's happening. But it's still, like I said, cheaper to recycle. So uh, continue to do that. I think anyone who has been recycling and throwing away trash, I mean, I think most normal, I think we expect most people are doing a, uh, a quantity of both, um, shouldn't see a net change on average in, in what they're paying when they go there. We <laughs> generate more recycling than trash, so. Uh, Some of us yeah. work. In Thanks, John. <laughs> sure. Did you have any questions about the other document, the food scrap piece, or I think you mentioned that in the email? Uh, well, I know that's something that we really have to work on for the transportation. But the transfer station currently collects. If that. you didn't know, collects food scraps. It's been a law to do so since July of last year. Yeah, that's where my so own trash goes. So. We do. We do have collection of food scraps there. Uh, to meet that law requirement. It's not a very robust business line item, but it, it's there for people that did value the service. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what does that fall under? Because I'm sure they don't bring it in by the 15 gallon bag. It's uh, by the gallon. It's charged by the gallon. And then the law says that by 2020 in July, it, that all food scraps will have to be diverted from the landfill. Um, my, my view is that, that the law is subject to discussions every year about how that's going to, how that's coming along. So uh, that could change. There will definitely be discussions about whether or not it's practical for uh, people in the hills to have. Where these composting locations are going to be up this year. 
in discussion too. Because there's two next to the state airports and birds and airports don't mm -hmm. match very yeah. well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of concerns about material and biological, you know, concerns with how people manage it. You have to go to a certified place, but then how do we train people that what goes into the co the food scraps is, which is going to be handled by people, and who knows if they're going to feed the people, or <laughs> you know, can we reapply it to soils where we grow food for human consumption without knowing what all those food scraps are made of coming into the system? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about that. I don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. Accept the rates. I'll make a motion we accept the rates as uh, proposed by Casella. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next, we have one home roads. <clears throat> the action item sheet um, for this item uh, lists the series of roads that our highway department has identified as being um, what they refer to as one home roads. Uh, the majority of these um, we are currently looking at for potential safety risks. Um, we are under pressure during the winter to ensure that all the roads are maintained uh, open and in accordance with the trans standards for class three roads. Um, these particular roads, again, we are looking at uh, for safety concerns because they are servicing one property and in many cases are smaller, isolated roads that do require uh, considerable attention. So what we would like the board to consider is potentially starting a hearing process that would allow the community to have input on whether these roads would be uh, classified as class four roads, then allowing our town crews to not have to maintain them as well as we would maintain a class three road. And the process for that, uh, uh, the process to commence would require the board to essentially schedule a public hearing. It would have to be 30 days uh, announcement and wait period from when the board decided to commence the period and then we could continue with the process after that. So on the list of roads, mm -hmm. road three, that must be just the stub off the Ferris Road that goes to their farm. Right, it's a, most of these are very small. Yeah. The Ferris Road actually goes from 14 up to the snow farm. Okay. So it's the whole road. It's, you're, I think you're getting at the little, a little tear little out. stub off the... Yeah, I don't have the map for, for the road. That's the wrong name. Yeah. Anyway, whatever that road is. So other than the um, the danger that the puts us, you know, our workers in and stuff, I see the loss of $800. Do we know what the cost is? I know the num amount of snowfall changes mm -hmm. annually. Or do we have an average cost about the, uh, these? We don't, but you do know that in terms of uh, staff time, uh, it could be that we have one driver who's driving in a large flat truck because they have a large route. And because some of these roads are much smaller that they can't accommodate a larger truck, once Setting they the perform, they have to head back fuel costs, jump in a smaller truck, head back and plow. Um, so there are instances that the, that, that exact thing happens on some of these roads. Um, not on all of them, but on, on some of them. It's got, it's got to be cheaper to not plow these and give up the money than to take the money and right. keep Oh, I'd assume so, yeah. yeah. I have good data. I was just wondering the magnitude. Yeah. yeah. I bet it's pretty significant. Um, I believe when we looked at it the first time, it was in the up to 16,000. And that sense. was on a, they used an average per mile. Hours. Yeah, it was an average number of hours that it took them. Okay. Some of these are, are like narrow roads that you don't have a good turning radius off the road. And then it's a long, straight, narrow driveway to the house. And they have to go get the loader because they got to go in and actually mm. scoop the snow out of the way. 
because they have no place to turn mm -hmm. to even remove the snow. The list used to be longer. I thought. I thought we were in the 20s on the roads that we were looking yeah, at a couple just years ago. Quickly, but. Yeah, I I have I compiled this list with our old our former superintendent. He and I were looking at the map, going through the roads, picked out the ones that he understood from the staff that were issues, but I couldn't find any historical data on the previous effort, so it could have been longer. Well, originally we looked at it as just getting all road one home roads done, mm -hmm. not necessarily the ones that were safety issues, but the ones that didn't meet our current standards. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the list was considerably longer. There was a recent, um, well, there are two court rulings that I should share with the board. One, um, I believe it was a town of uh, Ira, Ira, town of Ira, where they had made a decision <coughs> to eliminate their one home roads. Their decision did not go specifically into safety. Their decision was specifically based on just the economics uh, and the Supreme Court for the state decided that the town was not allowed to make the change strictly based on finances. They had to maintain the road open uh, to class three road standards. Uh, the town of Danvers, I believe, 2011 had a similar case. Uh, the town of Danvers's position was that their roads were a safety issue, that they had considerable damage to some of their vehicles, and then it became a problem uh, in terms of the public good because their vehicles were being damaged and their employees uh, had a greater potential for harm. So their plan to eliminate their one home roads was successful because it was specifically based on uh, evidence of safety. What I can do is if, if the board would like, I could revisit the roads that had been looked at before and uh, add them to the investigation of the safety concerns that exist. We should be looking at the, the characteristics of the road, the mm -hmm. width of the road, the turn and, radiuses. You know, is there a turn an area for them to turn around once they're up in there without yeah. doing the twenty point turns. Yeah. Is there plenty of room mm -hmm. even for snow storage and whatnot for them to operate? Because a lot of these just no one there isn't. Some of these you can't even meet another car on if the person is leaving for work as the full town vehicle got there. Maybe somebody would be back in them. So we need to set a date for the hearing. What are you looking at for time? Uh, for we have to have, have a 30 day notice period and the next select board meeting. Uh, the second Thursday of October would be within the 28 day period. So at the earliest, it would have to be Saturday, uh, I believe Saturday the 15th. 13th. It was, you know. 13th. So if, if, this, if the board wanted to just, like we did at the last meeting, meet on the third Thursday of the month as opposed to the second, then we would be in compliance. That would move our meeting to the 18th. I won't be here. But you feel free to have it that night. <laughs> <laughs> we can set a special day for it. Yeah. When are you when are you available, Mike? <laughs> Saturday morning. Tell me what you're thinking first. But you're out that whole week. It's not like just that day kind of thing, right? No, Wednesday to Wednesday, the 17th to the 24th. Okay. So that Monday or Tuesday is open. Yeah. Is anybody else available to us? I'm open the 15, 16, either one. Okay. So we're talking about making the, changing the, our, our meeting to that day? Just postponing our meeting to early the following week, 15th to the 16th. Or just a special meeting? This would be a special this, hearing. For this us. Would be, so this would be just the special meeting? Yeah. Oh, in addition to this select board meeting? Okay. Because we could just move the whole meeting. Right. And just take care of it all at once. That would be fine with me. Exactly. 
to do that, the 15th or the 16th, I could do either one. I will probably leave early that night. If it's which night? The 16th. The 16th. Just because I have a 545 flight on Wednesday morning, so it's a big baby. <laughs> I appreciate that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I would have said the same thing to you guys. <laughs> How about the 15th? It's Monday the 15th. Monday the 15th. We're going to move the whole select like board meeting too. Yeah, yeah, we can move on with that. Public hearing in it. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, come. Yeah, the 15th or 11th anyway. Can you find 530 p.m.? Sure. Okay. Same place. <laughs> Not at my house. <laughs> you sure? Is that closer? <laughs> yeah, closer there, for me. there might be 19 people there. <laughs> 18 there. Okay. I don't think the construction is going to be done by then. Though. Municipal tax rate. We have Ed Luce, our head lister here for that. Uh oh. So, Ed, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, on uh, line one, it's 0. 0.7511 for the Homestead Municipal last year. What is it now? I'm sorry. 0. Yeah, 7638. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, oh, backside. Sorry, Yeah. <laughs> We recycle, it's good. Police district one is about three quarters of a cent. trying to keep everything level funded so the numbers won't fluctuate too much. Um, in fact, we may actually uh, have some savings, but yeah, we won't, we won't have very many changes. So the majority of our tax rate overall increase, we don't have any control over. Yeah. No, 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 locally. <coughs> locally, I mean, our rate's our, been doing good. Right, well, yeah, we're, we're good, but yeah. it's the state education tax rate keeps going up and down. We still blame us. No, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any Just questions on it? And it sucks. Yeah. 
I move we accept the municipal tax rates for fiscal year 2019. Second. I think we favor all right. Okay. 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 Ok
Um, last year, Adolfo and I were just barely here, and we saw how, how big it was and how everyone in town came to Randolph. Um, so a lot of our ideas was kind of like maybe closing down the Main Street. I went around the businesses, Bright Aid, the, the gas stations and stuff, and they're all for it. Um, I asked them if they're in, they're okay to have some more events in town that shut off that street between um, Salisbury and the gazebo. Um, and um, they're like, you, we get more traffic in our business when you close down the street <laughs> than we do. Um, and so, and they also love to participate. There are a lot of businesses for Halloween participate. They also feel like it would provide more safety for the kids to go to business to business. Um, we also um, heard from a lot of parents that there's no food really there for their trick or treating and all that, and then it's hard to get dinner, you know. And so, our vision was to have a little bit, maybe one or two food trucks. Might not happen this year, um, but moving forward, that's probably something we, I would like to get one or two food trucks, close down the street, put our tables out from the pool, and you know have more of a, a place where people can gather, the kids can do trick-or-treating and have some more food options. I think it would be a nice event um, for our community. And the public, the, on Main Street, loves it. They're like, we love participating, we want to be involved. Um, and we're not asking for money or asking for donations so they even like it better. They're like, we get more food traffic, we get, you know, we make more money those days anyway. So um, the next one that I've been working on, I hope that you guys consider a blessing here is um, a winter parade. Many years ago that we had a winter parade, um, been working with um, Valerie Schoolcraft and I, we are putting together a small committee with our rec committee. Uh, putting together a winter light parade. So it's kind of like bringing back those horses and oxen and small little tractors and, and sleighs down Main Street. Um, we want to put it together with our um, tree lighting event that we did last year that was very successful. Uh, Lou Stoll already confirmed um, another tree this year. He's very excited to have us over uh, to select the tree. Um, I also looking into with Adolfo and, and, and Bill about the, that tree next to the gazebo, maybe bringing it down and replanting with a better tree. Um, so that can be our tree that we decorate so we don't have to keep cutting trees down uh, and putting one in the middle. <laughs> um, it's pretty dead and I don't think, I think by replacing it with a better tree that we can light and we can grow better, um, we can decorate that tree and make it look pretty nice. Um, so that is something that I would like to move forward with and we're trying to figure out how to get that done. Uh, but in the meantime, if we don't get it done for this year, Lou is ready for another trip. So um, the parade will happen. I talked to the League of Cities. We're all kind of clear to go once I get the permit in. So next month, you'll see two of my assembly permits coming through, the safe and scene and the winter parade. Um, I like the group we're working with as a small committed group that um, wants to get back to Randolph and bring back some holiday cheer. Uh, we want that we want that event to be our kickoff to to the holiday. You know, with the small little parade, lighting up the tree. Santa's there on December first. It is the day that uh, Lori Morgan is coming to town. And the idea was kind of spurred up with the Chandler, stating that there's going to be people in Randolph that day. If we had it between five and six, the, um, the little parade and then the tree lighting. Those that have kids are not going to go to the concert. We'll have our Santa hot chocolate and those that at 730 want to go to the concert, they have their concert. Um, and I mean, it will have a lot of people in town, you know. And um, I'm willing to do it with our little committee. And so I hope you guys agree that it's something good for Randolph. Um, a lot of people have been talking about it. No one has knocked it down. They're like, really? I brought it to the rec committee. They thought it was good. They're like, if you have the energy, go for it. <laughs> um, you know, I'm willing to give it a try. Um, that's why those that are in our committee, you know, want to help as much as possible. And if I didn't have uh, a small committee, there's no way I would do it on my, on my own. So um, that is something that if you guys had any thoughts or questions, no? Good? Bad idea? 
Well, like I think Val Valerie sent me an email this week. I hadn't responded yet. I've been uh, crazy busy, but I'm um, asking about the fire department. And that yes. really that just has to go to chief, you know, for for his uh, his, and he'll bring it to the membership. And, um, probably best to do that before the next beginning yes. of well, October. Yeah, we've been trying, so okay. So, so somebody's reached out to him. Or? We've been trying today, yeah. Okay. Well, we, we can, can help with that. We, we can know. remind him a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Michael, do it. Yes, we're Yeah, that big permit. That's why I was like. Got to make sure you know, the insurance needs to see all. I need to get things ready. Um, talk to the, the sheriffs as well. And so we've been putting little plugs in and stuff. And overall, it seems people are very excited about it. Yeah, seems neat. So one, one item that I don't think Heidi will talk about today, uh, but something that she did bring up to me a few months ago that uh, took some time to develop, and that was a the potential for a tri town recreation department. Um, that was your initial thought. We have since been able to establish communication with Brookfield and Braintree. Both towns are interested in at the very least having the conversation of what it would entail to have a, a Tri-Town Recreation Department. Uh, we are meeting with them next week, the 20th. Um, Heidi will speak with them about some of the programming that could happen there um, and what their investment could be in the Randolph Recreation Department, whether it be through taxation of their population uh, reduced rates uh, similar to the Randolph resident rates here in town, and then also additional programming in their, in their town. So uh, that's something that we were hoping to do to make use of the infrastructure we already have and the resources we already have, um, and that was something that Heidi brought to us. And is for now, in the planning stages, and we'll eventually bring it to the board for, for consideration. I think, yeah, I think it's a good idea. The, the other thing I was thinking of, Heidi, when, I'm, when we were talking about the track town stuff before was with uh, some of these other schools um, getting smaller or closing down. And I know some of the residents are changing even locations of where they're going to. And I know we got a certain population that came to the high school because of the other schools. But I'm wondering what the effect is on their local youth programs for sports, whether it's baseball, basketball, and soccer. And I think, you know, with the strengthening of our programs here underneath the umbrella of the town, rec department, if there's an opportunity to do some outreach to those folks so that as they get older, they'll be more interested in coming to the, the high school Bethel here. I've been and, and South Rolton and okay. stuff, and I'm especially Bethel. Well, I know right? like Rochester or, Rochester well, we play. We or Chelsea or, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what their health of their youth programs are we're, across we're the board. We're definitely but. playing them. I would like to take them more under, like, um, it would be more coordination if yeah. Bethel just came, um, because we're playing against barely any teams, they're barely making their numbers, and they're co-ed. Right. And that will, it's going to die. And I think some of the challenge with busy lives of everybody traveling, you know, I know the baseball teams were starting to have to travel to Washington to play a ball game with the young people because we couldn't find teams, you know, yeah. local, but if we can grow it we're looking from those surrounding teams like, and play internally yeah, more. Yeah, our ones and twos, we got uh, 55 kids. We have five teams, so we can play um, internally. Soccer. There's no, yeah, cool. there's no reason to go out, and so those numbers, I've definitely have gone up since last year, Good. and I'm hoping that with with the changes that I've provided with having more games at even at four years old, it's brought so they've had a good time at pre-K and K. Now the ones and twos are filling in, Great. and we're trying to fill in the threes and fours. Um, things are changing slowly, <clears throat> kind of deal, but I think overall people are liking it. The kids are more involved, and um, you know I'm especially baffled or those kind of teams that are co-ed and they're barely doing really. yeah. I'd rather just them come up, you know, and then we can provide something, you know, for them. But, and then just include in our, on our teams. Sure. You know, yeah, so at sense. least they have a consistent team and they'll have games and then we can play more internally. So okay. I've been going up more to Williamstown and Northfield to play because I know they're going to have teams that I can yeah. trust that are going to be there every day. Sure. Um, on that note, too, um, in the fall, we are putting together a little bit of an after school, the early release days. We'll coincide it with the camp, I mean, the camp building for one day. Um, this would be good because then we'll, we're charging $20 just like the school is for an after school. It'll help us get more kids in the ice rink as well. Uh, if they sign up for $20, they get some activities done and they get to have access to the ice rink. 
because hopefully that will encourage people to learn, you know, build our learn to skate program or get out there and skate and uh, build that program. So that's kind of my next target. Um, we'll see how that goes. And then um, also with Parks and Rec or Rec Committee, we're working on the ordinances. So you'll, once we start, some ordinance specifically to parks or skateboard. So we've had some youth come to us asking to revise or amend the skateboarding. So with them, this is a great way to them for, to them, for them to get involved. We have amended some of the skateboarding horses that were done about 30 years ago, um, updating them. We'll, we'll take them, we'll review them, we'll update them, we'll put it through the right process between the attorneys, town manager, and then we'll come to you. Um, same thing with the park ordinances for closing the parks um, at night and some just basic rules. We don't have any of that. Um, we're, gonna, we're definitely working on different models. We'll definitely, um, Zach Freeman is involved, so with some of the trails, we're running some of that. As well, he, he also commented how we should work with the Conservation Commission on signages and stuff like that. So we're all in the same boat right now, and um, if we all work together and certain those things, we can definitely be a um, good help to each other, especially with the parks. We definitely need to update our signage at our parks, at our facilities, you know, especially at the ice rink, the, the pool. And so uh, we hope with that momentum that the town is going with, we'll, have, we'll be working on that. So that's a big project for the committee, which they're all invested. So our committee, if you don't know, there's five, and there has room for one more or two more, but they're all broken up into subcommittees. And so some are involved in ordinances, some are involved in special events too, some are involved in hopefully finding some more grants for us. And so everyone's trying to do a little bit so we can get things done. That's my goal is to try to get things done. And so, right? Push it along. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... So we got a lot yeah. of work. Well, I would, I would, I, I mean, hesitate to say it because you've heard me say it so many times, but you know, I. I think everything that's been going on in the rectum has been awesome and all the changes that you've made, it's all just been one positive thing after another and anytime I hear anybody talk about the rec department or the job you're doing, it's always really positive. I never hear a negative thing about the rec program. It's awesome. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> She's from LA. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Two of you at this yeah, point. Yeah, two of you. <laughs> Make yeah. two in a little bit down. <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but we got here. We're here. We got a lot of energy, so um, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions, and it's nice, and I'll try to come quarterly, or you know, I record it, come and update. Um, but we got a lot of things in it. I just can't believe it's already the fall and spring is going to be happening soon. And, you know, it's just really fast. <laughs> yeah. Things are rolling. So. Get a quick general question, if I may, on the rec, kind of with the rec department and also with the town kind of things. Like, there was talk not too long ago about expanding uh, to, like, a different area, building more soccer fields and ball fields and all that other stuff. And I don't, is there... Is well, that in the landfill? That's what I heard was yeah. landfill. I didn't want to say there just because if if that was just rumor only, but yeah, I'd heard the landfill for getting some more Waste more facilities. Depository land. Yeah, I mean there. because right, there's <laughs> certainly options right for for hosting. We can't host like a baseball tournament where we have a, we can during the day, but we don't have lights. We only have one field and yeah. you know stuff like that. And um, there's not as much challenge with the high school getting a large field anymore as there used to be. Um, but even so, there's the men's league. There's Babe Ruth. There's uh, <laughs> Um, Legion Ball all trying to share that resource right now. VTC used to be an option, but it's just since they get rid of their ball program, it's not even a usable yeah. field anymore. I was maintaining it for several years, but yeah, it's got too old. Too, I participate in the softball league for adults, and that's something that I want to be able to do more with adults. Yeah, it's not even here, right? No, and there's, you know, I was part of the Randolph team, and the Randolph team had to go to share it. Yeah. You know, there's nothing for the men's or women or co ed, and that's. It was amazing to see, you know, we're from California. You don't get these numbers in California for softball. And so um, the, pe the families that are involved that we could, you know, if we had a ball field or yeah. a bigger space, you know, um, there's some great fields that I've seen now that I was able to travel to and stuff. And I'm like, wow, why can't we have this? 
you know, so it's, yeah, that property was mentioned one time ago to me. So it's still being thought about, talked about? Well, one of the challenges is that there Funding is a, uh, yeah. a rail crossing yeah. uh, on Landfill Road leading into it, and I have not looked at the specific rail regulations, but I believe that if we are to install a new rail crossing, we have to eliminate one currently in the town. And so if we open up the landfill for recreation to make it more easily accessible to people, um, we would have to then determine where else in town it would be safe for us to eliminate a rail crossing. Mm -hmm. Actually, that crossing's already there. Mm -hmm. So you'd be changing the type of crossing that's there. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have to eliminate another one. Oh, okay. The big question would be, if it would go, because I think it's a farm crossing mm -hmm. at this point, technically. So would it need to go to, uh, what would they require it to go yeah. to? Okay. But we can look at that if you Don't okay. let that be your stumbling block. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also want to open the land for you, but that's a whole other. As it wasn't talking yeah. about the branch of property, <laughs> so, there's a potential there. It's a, it's a great piece of land, kind of deal, and that's a, probably a, an ideal space for, um, Bocce courts, um, a small dog park to the right. You know, um, there's parking, we can park in there or another play structure. Not much green, but yeah, there is you know some potential there. Yeah. How about that exit four property? That's empty right now. Yeah, that'd be great. A lot of ball problem. fields out there, ball. very accessible. Feel the dreams, right? Yeah, <laughs> green. it would still be green. green. <laughs> We'll move on to the pool. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is review of the RFQ for pool repairs. So the pool was constructed back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Have we looked at whether it's worth dumping more money into it versus a new pool? Yeah, no, I mean, we retrofitted in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had um, we've had people come and survey the pool and um, give us a survey about our pool standing, and uh, they 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 all like our pool. I mean, they're impressed on the shape of how we have maintained it and stuff. So for being a 50 year old pool, it's not in bad shape compared to other pools they've seen around Vermont. Um, and we had that assessment done early on in May. Um, before we found out the leak was here. Uh, we have uh, uh, found the leak in isolated situation um, to two pipes in the same location. Um, with the cameras, we're able to detect it and see it. And so we don't have to dig up the whole thing to repair it. There's just a section that we need to do. Um, and the skimmers, the, that's the main, one of the main issues are the repairment of the skimmers. and then. Uh, with the technology now, there's there are better skimmers now, and you know they'll last us another 30, 40 years if we get the good ones um, and do it right. To answer your question specifically, Trini, uh, Heidi and I had a preliminary conversation about potential costs for a new swimming pool, uh, especially one of our size. Um, although we didn't have, we didn't, we didn't spend money to bring in a consultant to identify, you know our space constraints, what we had, how much it would cost. Uh, we did have some very uh, non-specific information shared with us by some of the pool people that would come to take a look at our problem and say that we could potentially have uh, a new swimming pool in the half a million dollar range. So it would be a lot more expensive than repairing it, but you're right, at the same time, it could be the pool for the future and it'd be a much more costly project. Sometimes you can find grants if it's a new item versus yeah. a maintenance item too. So if you could get a grant to so pay for a matching grant, part of it, to, yeah. but your match is still. Yeah. Well, there's just a rub and pull right there. Without any buildings built, it was two point three million dollars. And and the person, the contractor that built that was here. Uh, he was like, your facility is much nicer. Um, your park is nicer, you know, and so, you know, we have a good space, we have a nice pool. And so we can, you know, spruce it up, and need, need some love, and get it, you know, corrected, then it can be a good thing. But yeah. around that, I mean, they have a, a competition pool, and they have a whole kid pool. It's a 
25 meter competition pool. And then I'm up updating their facilities with bathroom and all that's where the cost really come in. I think one of the challenges that we are facing is the community's need to want to open the pool. Yeah. And we, we could, from my perspective, uh, I would be more than willing to delay the project as long as we could to see if it would be a better investment to have a brand new pool put into place. Um, that would, if, you know, if we find that that would be a costly project, it would delay opening the existing swimming pool. Um, but it would be an opportunity to potentially investigate if we can get a brand new pool for the same size for you know, not much more money than $100,000. The challenge there is the community coming to the select board, coming to town hall saying, you know, we promised to have the pool. I, mean, I never once promised to have the pool open uh, by a specific time, always saying that we're addressing the problem we're into, looking into it. But you know, if the board wanted to make that decision, I could certainly delay this process a little bit. So did they feel that we put this 80,000 into the pool, that'll buy us how many years for the, did they say? Or do we have any idea what that's gonna? Well, there's the, 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 the skimmers have a good lifetime. Um, they do last between 30, 20, 30 years. Um, the, the new piping still looks really good. We cameraed it. All the people who came to camera it, they're like, wow, this still looks pretty good. It's PC. Um, it was, you can, you can clearly see with the camera that there, it's all in good condition. Still, so if if the pipes were in bad condition, I would tell you that. Like, yeah, maybe that's it, but it's not. So, you know, it's a hard call. You know, we can talk about it, see what the lifespan is of a few of those items. But overall, the the pool consultant that came, I can show, I can forward you his report to you, um, and it shows that it's, it's in pretty good condition for the for being a 50-year-old pool. And he's been all over. I took a class from him, the pool operator class, and that's why I trusted him to come out and really check our pool detail analysis and stuff, and I can share that with you. A pretty good pool for its no, age versus how long it will last. But new pool is going to be like two to three million dollars, the size of the pool we have. Two to three, five hundred thousand. That's not. A, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I like his number better. <laughs> well, I do, but uh, I had also thought about you know a year-round structure, <laughs> which could potentially be more costly with you know a basic structure with potentially garage doors that open and close that would be potentially insulated, so we could use it year-round. Um, you know, it would be possible to look into it have someone you know, give us a more detailed look uh, or have a more detailed look at what it would cost to potentially have a year-round pool so we could use it year-round. Um, but with the challenge of, you know, if we do delay, if the board chooses to delay approving this, you know, we could put it off another month. Um, I don't think it would put it in complete danger of not opening in time for next year um, because I don't believe we have very much time left this year for construction anyways. Um, we have 100000 just sitting in the rec budget. No, that would, the cost for repairs would put off repairs to the existing swimming pool building. We had put aside $40,000 for it. We had also put aside um, a considerable amount of money for repairs to the East Randolph Hall. Uh, we have learned that uh, repairs to that hall uh, will have to be done on a much longer time span than we had initially anticipated. So we're borrowing money that we already have put aside for pool building, and then also money that we have put aside for repairs to East Randolph Hall, knowing full well that by the time we get to those types of repairs at East Randolph Hall, we would have been able to re-raise the funds through tax. I just know that the community, you know, this summer was really loud and clear that the pool is very important. And I think they've all expressed this to you. Um, I think a delay in this would would really discourage people in this town because you never know it would take years to build a new pool, you know. And so we have a great asset in our community right now, and it's really important not only to staffing for kids, for our camps. Um, I mean, I heard it every day, you know, and I know you have too. So. Um, I think 
we can get you more reports about how much it will last, but I think this investment uh, would be a good one for this pool. It's a great pool, and I know the community really, really loves it, and I know they were really upset this summer, but who knows how long it would take to build another one. We I mean, have a great asset just sitting there. We have a great asset in East Randolph sitting there. Is the oh, yeah, no, I agree with that, so. too. But we have we <laughs> saved money with the water. We didn't, we put the water on there, so there's another about 30000 there with water that we did not spend. Um, the 40000 40, with the building. The building can last a little longer. Um, so we have about sixty seventy thousand. 70000 So that's why an RFQ is important. Uh, I think if you get qualifications, you get a really good contractor that has expertise in the field of the pool, um, then I think you can get a good contract rather than just getting money. So just so I'm clear, the intention is to do it this fall? The well, construction? The yeah, it can do a lot of it right now and then finish in the spring. Yeah. If we go through it right now. And, I'm and hesitating. If we push it forward, there's still a lot of work. So if we push it to the spring not knowing the weather, we might go into June to open so I see the dates highlighted on the back here. So when would you want? Yeah, no, understood. So yeah. when would you want the RQ responses back? Um, ideally, with, as soon as the board approves it, we'll start working with the board. I think there has to be a two-week uh, advertisement period, so we'd have to post it online, send it out, um, and then give a two-week notice. So ideally, we sent it out not tomorrow, but early next week, uh, by early next month, October. If we had the same contract year we did last year, we were, um, we had the, they were able to work until December. Yeah. So I guess personally, I mean, I have no problem with going on getting the RFQs, but I, I'd like to see what, you know, what the expectation of how long the material is going to last and what the cost of a new pool is, sure. right? And then before we actually let the contract on it, I guess. Okay. And if we have a select board meeting prior to awarding anything, and what we're not going to do. So what are we not going to do to right. make this happen? Because yeah. the, clearly the money's not in the recreation budget. Yeah. So if the board would like, we could, we could delay one month um, the next month until we can provide more information, uh, including the items that will be pushed off for future getting the RFQ doesn't commit you to right. yeah. so I think you can get the RFQ out still get the process started so if the cost is astronomical or in the well, in the, the RFQ you're not getting a cost half request this for is glory. written for a proposal and half is for qualifications so which one are we asking for qualifications you're just telling you hey we've done a whole bunch of these high risk I thought they're getting RFQ typically is how, what, how am I able to do this and how much is it going to cost you no nope. RFQ doesn't keep request cost. for quote no, it says request no, for, for qualification. Oh, qualification. There's no price involved until you get down to this oh. stage. But the back side is written as a proposal. Mm -hmm. So we'd, we'd, have have to, we'd have to clean it up. Why are we doing design and build if it's replacing two pipes and installing skimmers? What are they designing? Well, we can talk about that with the, the proposal. We want, we want to find somebody who's a contractor that specifies works with pools. Not just some contractor that, oh, I can do some pipes. Or that. We want somebody that knows what they're doing because it is for picking, you know, we're digging up the slabs of concrete. It's really close to the actual pool. Um, Usually you would do that in, for a proposal where they would give you what their qualifications are and you would score them using points according no, to. No, I agree. But we that, and then you get the bids so you know about what it's going to cost you at the same time. Right. And then, because it may not be right we now. Talk, we talked to a few, we, we walked through, did a walkthrough with a few of the contractors. Um, this is something that they would do a few times. Um, and those costs are based on the contractors that we talked to that, that did that do pools for municipalities. What we're going to want to see when we look at this isn't just what we aren't going to do, how long is it going to last, but when the bids come in, what is it a qualified person to do the work but what are they bidding for to do that work so along, along those lines if you just look at the work to be completed does the number seem astronomical to you because it does to me because when you look at the work to, described it says replace a uh, four inch pipe some concrete panels and some pavement and 13 skimmers 
hundred thousand dollars seems like a lot. It's, it's right. I mean, just looking at that. That's, that's, a, that's a little cushion. So we, we actually were at about seventy thousand dollars. So it's about. Uh, I don't want to get into specifics, but it's it's around there. The concrete is a set price already. Um, that's why we wanted to negotiate with a contractor that has experience rather than just get the lowest bid. So, so just, just so I'm clear, there's been several contractors who they've given you some analysis of what mm -hmm. needs to be done. They've given you a roundabout number of what needs to be done. So to me, I think, in my world anyway, and maybe I'm wrong here, is that when proposals go out from the government to us, we say, hey, this is why we can do your project, and this is how much it's going to cost you. And they say, this is what I want done. I guess I expected that same kind of thing here. The town says, we've got this problem. This is what we think, or we've heard it has to be done. Will you provide analysis? What are your qualifications, and how much is it going to cost us? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, that's what I would expect, too. And um, then it comes back, we have, okay, qualifications. They say this is going to be done, but Company X found this other thing that they think has to be done, too, that maybe Company Y didn't see or didn't consider. And then it's a really a good comparison along with the associated costs, and we compare that against what the, uh, the cost to repair or replace versus and the longevity. I don't know. And I think I'd put in the, you know, with your work, what are you warranting for and what are the expectation of life? Yeah. My recommendation. Thank you. And so you also want to do some research, like you know the actual numbers of the Rutland pool or some other pools in the same size that well, we recently built in Vermont. It sounds like Rutland's is different. Right. Just two pools. Right. I I don't I don't know how quick pool companies work. I mean, or how quickly our RFQ process works, but what about putting an RFQ for total replacement and, seeing, and having a couple of people bid that and see what that costs? I don't know. I'm throwing that out there. I don't know what kind of... I, that's work that you understand more than I do from a town perspective. I, I, I'm, more, I'm more than willing to do it. Absolutely. Um, and if we get them both back at the same time, right? I mean, yeah. What well, can you include in the same RFP? The scope of work of the scope of work or... And or the rebuild? I don't, rebuild? I don't know what the town rules are. Government typically, what I'm used to is they'll, you know, if you do repairs this, you know, it's two different things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that. Lots of times they'll have two different types of businesses that bid on it. Right. One of them may not repair them, may just do new installs. Yeah. I, I, so I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. I'm not trying to prolong anything. No. I just. So can the town so put two RFPs at the same time? Yeah. I don't see why not. Build a new pool or go in another year without a pool. Yeah. No, I understand, but but no if guarantees of another pool. But in answer to the question that is also being asked of, we don't if we put a hundred thousand dollars and don't do other stuff. What are we gaining for time versus the cost of a new pool? Nobody's. We're not sure what the cost. Of that yeah, no, I'm just be. thinking of the all the peripheral it? stuff with locating a new pool. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> locating a new pool. Well, are you going to remove it from where it is and then build a whole new one there? Or are you going to find a new location so that way you can speed yeah, up the know. process? I, I, I'm not and familiar with the pool, pool removal and replacement timelines. Anyway, yeah. I think we can put off that conversation. <laughs> um, it, sounds, it sounds like we can do some more investigating and still move ahead and not lose time. Yeah, right? that's what I was thinking. So I, I don't see any reason why I shouldn't do that. Keep our options open. Make sure that we're not doing something stupid because we want to just make sure we have a pool next year. Um, but we're not. Yeah, and I just don't know. We put a lot of work just, into that. And we yeah, spent yeah. the whole no, summer no, I, I, investigating. I, yeah, yeah. And we spent no, I, hours. I, 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 I want to see. I would love to see a pool next next year, but it just seems like there's some reasonable concerns that it wouldn't. That it would be prudent just to make sure that this is the right path. That that. Putting in a new pool, if it if it turns out that that's a better investment, I don't see why we'd want to rule it out at this point. Um, if we can make that decision at our next meeting, right? Can... So if the board would like, uh, what we can do is we can continue with the process with the caveat that we do a better job with wording the uh, RFQ that was put in front of the board, make it more consistent so that it's either an RFQ or an RFP, fixing all of the errors that are in there while 
moving forward with the understanding that additional information needs to be presented to the board, potential costs, uh, time frames for infrastructure that's going to be replaced, whether it be better for us in the long run to have a new swimming pool put in place, what the replacement costs would be, uh, even potentially go as far as identify a potential new location within the park, potentially on the other side of the river to place a new pool and then replace the existing pool area with grass surface to you know, not lose too much park surface area. So there's no use offer food. So in, just a little note, and the reason why we did, I think, the RFQ is because, um, I'm not here to speak for Mari, but she felt comfortable doing a uh, RFP. She wasn't, you know, knowledgeable with the pool. You know, so is there something like, if the town doesn't have someone to write that, how would work around that? Writing it an RFP yeah. for the pool specifically. I can help with that. The well, we scope of work is about the same. We'll work it out. Yeah. The process is about the same. Mm -hmm. Cues you usually use when you want to go out and find a group of. No, yeah, that's what we went with that because that's what Marty felt comfortable doing. Yeah, and but, then you still have to put the RFP out to those. Yeah, the RFQ. So you still got to develop it. It's just another step. So, yeah, so to me is you've already had a study, you've identified what's wrong, the RFP would go out as, I would like to know from company X, Y, and Z how much it costs to do this work, what, are your, what is your past performance on this, what are your references on this, and what is a warranty and lifespan expectation? I mean, we've already paid the time, and you spend hours and hours, right, with companies trying to identify what the issues were. So it seems like well, here's our problem, what's it cost to fix it, and what's your qualifications to do so. I just would like to see to, to make sure that we don't delay the opening of pool next year if we decide that we're going to fix this pool. That right. No, I think I, I think we can just, move quickly and okay, have it. I, just, I, just, I think the month time frame that I heard from Adolfo is certainly doable to write in our. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just putting it out there again. I just wanna, it's not much I longer want us, than want us to be this. spending time looking at something else and then have it be like, oh, and we now we need another month and now. No, it's, no, no, understood. That's all. I just want to make And I think you can reference a document and provide that document of the findings right as part of your RFP that goes out. This is what we've paid to identify what it, and this is what was identified as wrong. And I would leave a little cushion, you know, that says, hey, if you find anything else and Yeah, that's why we did that. But I have an intuition that the new pool is gonna be way more than Oh I prepared probably but do. without doing our homework. Yeah, yeah, I, no, I, I I no I agree. I agree. I just I wanna have my cake and eat it too here. I wanna see what the yeah. new pool costs, but also go ahead with making sure that we can if we don't put a new pool get get one in on as fast as we can. And to that point, okay. right, when we went through all the fire station stuff, right, all the up upgrades and all that other stuff that was required, it could be astronomical because of yeah, whatever well, compliance is. Yeah. Calls probably will not be compliant. Yeah, so so I get it. I'm just just trying to be responsible with what what yep. the cost is because yep. it's not a little bit. And I don't know. Does the Randolph East Randolph Hall Community Group aware of this? A little. <laughs> they're more than happy, but they're not. <laughs> they understand that that we have. Well, there's got to be more than that on there. Yeah, they have roughly about 120,000 that had been programmed for each rental hall, 40,000 alone for ADA bathrooms, and that had been put aside for immediate work so that the hall can open right away. We have since learned that it's going to take a long time to open it, so getting to the bathrooms may take a year or two, um, and in that time we'll have $40,000 in the capital budget that could be used elsewhere, and we could recuperate, recuperate it over time. Um, the group isn't entirely happy. They don't fully agree, but they also understand that we're not going to get to the bathrooms right away. So just for my curiosity, and how long does it take to recoup $40,000 into that fund? Depends on how much we want the taxation to hurt <laughs> every year. I mean, it won't, it won't take, it, you know, it could take two, three, four years okay. to recoup that amount. I just want to make sure it wasn't a decade or two. No, it wouldn't be that long. No. Okay. But it could be that long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make these? No, just not on the table. Okay. So you need a motion to issue the RFP? Is that what you need? If I, I okay. actually would feel more comfortable if, <laughs> if the board would make the motion to 
issue the RFP with the caveat that we make all the necessary changes to improve the language. And then what we can do is we can work with staff and then also with you, Michael, to spruce it up a little bit. What's the story behind the cookies? Oh, uh, the Meals Randolph Region Group, uh, which recently formed, wow. what, the cookies are brought to you by the Meals Randolph Group. They had a community luncheon this morning to try to bring attention to the needs of uh, certain members of the population of Randolph that need help. Um, and the luncheon was held today. It was not as successful as they would have liked. Um, so they had excess food. They were able to bring it to town hall, share with some of the staff, and then also now brought it to the meeting. So. There's muffins too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the food. I have to give this but back. But I'm not they might not. They've been our last. <laughs> the rate we're going. All right. Entertain a motion to authorize the issuance of the RFP. So I make a motion that we authorize the RFP release with uh, modifications to the wording to address uh, the pool repair covering uh, qualifications, warranty periods, and uh, longevity estimates. And the cost of a new pool? And the cost, yeah. Second. Motion in the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Heidi. <laughs> It would be cheap if we got everyone getting pool and a slip and slide. The <laughs> 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 pool has a water slide. Yeah, right. <laughs> Build the one off White River exit. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Okay. So next we have the assembly permit yeah. for the fall foliage run. Uh, we received a request from um, uh, Mark Matt uh, Matt Mamorowski. Matt uh, this is uh, an annual running of race event. The assembly permit was dropped off earlier this week. Uh, Shannon has been working diligently to try to obtain all the necessary signatures. We have uh, received the signature of uh, Chief Collette. Uh, I'm not sure if you've received others. Uh, yeah. from the police chief, too, I think. Yeah. Oh, Sheriff Pontiac has already, yeah. Oh, Sheriff, sure. yeah, Chief. So the uh, permit for upper pass coming also separate. There's separate permit for what? Upper pass. It says that beer provided and served by upper pass will be served under their license and that. Oh, in terms of uh, we have not received that. No. So we could reach out to Matt. Any questions on the possibility of run? How do you run an engine? Really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard, especially on the actual part. Yeah. You feel it. <coughs> you really just look at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> it leaves it felt like it. <laughs> That's right, you can actually. Wait. Okay. Any concerns with that one? No. Move that we accept the assembly permit for the fall foliage 15K running race. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? All right. All right. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. ETC Homecoming Festival. We received a telephone call from ETC's event coordinator. Um, I've looked through our records and have not found. Um, evidence that permit had previously been issued for this event, so I think maybe it's a new person planning the event, went on the town's website to learn about our permitting process and submitted the application. 
Uh, the event is scheduled to take place later this month on the 26th, and it is specifically for their homecoming activities. I believe they're going to have a live music area, uh, photographs uh, at the end of the package show where the music will be. Uh, they do have their on-site security, and we are currently working to obtain, uh, again, all the necessary signatures from the staff. Oh, yes, we, our current health officer is not, uh, the primary health officer is currently not in town, she's out of town. The assistant, um, the deputy health officer reviewed the form, felt that because it was on the college campus that we would not necessarily have to approve of the actual permit itself. Um, but that was a decision the deputy officer made. Should we do it if it was at Gifford? Mm -hmm. Or someplace else. Yeah. What do you think that? I don't know. Motion to accept VTC homecoming permit application. With like the health officer's signature. With the health officer's signature. Or associate assistant. Back up. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Sustained? Motion carries. Economic development? The, the next line item or agenda item is part of a previous uh, loosely related conversation that the board uh, had brought up during a previous meeting. What staff, have, uh, staff members have done is compile a list of Potential characteristics of something that we would like to advertise with uh, uh, the positions. One is the economic development position. A different component would be the community development component, and then also the grant administrator component. Um, we have shared drafts of position announcements with members of the community. They have shared that with their uh, contacts with the R3 groups. Um, we have received comments from those groups. Uh, we received comments just before the start of the meeting, so I wasn't able to include them in your packet. But uh, for the most part, the comments will be incorporated eventually into a uh, position announcement. Uh, but I was hoping to have the select board review these list of potential characteristics, see which ones worked, which ones did not, or if for some reason, if we left something out or didn't think of it, so we could have the board's input on what to look for. We have identified um, enough money to offer a position, um, a salary. We have consulted with our attorney and determined that we can make this position a temporary contract position. Um, in terms of length of time, we haven't determined length of time, but we have a three-year period for now included as a potential time frame. Uh, but we do have, again, uh, at the very least identified roughly about fifty to $60,000 worth of funding to be able to pay for a salary position with uh, no benefits such as health care because it is a contracted position. Fifty to 60 annually, not for the term of three years total. Annually. Yeah. Yeah, annually. We're also working with a bit of a tangent, but Currently speaking with the school district um, and seeing how those conversations go, and subsequently with Gifford, if we could work to eliminate one of our existing positions, say for example our, our current vacant buildings and grounds director position, and we could repurpose some of that salary toward this position and make it a potentially more attractive salary for someone. Um, just a way to mainstream what we have and what we need. Um, there have been, there has been input from different members of the community. Some have expressed concern with the availability of different sites, websites that uh, advertise different events in town. Some advertise in one area, some advertise in others. They seem to potentially compete with each other. Some don't list. There's no real connectivity between all of them. 
Um, so one recommendation had been previously made that this person should also focus on that type of work. Um, it, it would be challenging to find somebody to do economic development, business background, and then also someone who's IT capable because if we, if we do make the position too broad, then we risk uh, setting this person up for failure because we're expecting one thing and then they're not going to be able to fully deliver. Do you want comments on these from the board? Uh, would love comments, uh, suggestions, recommendations. Um, if the board wanted to strike a few or leave them in or just make suggestions for how to augment the points, it would be very helpful for us as we work towards the recruitment process. What are you planning to recruit? Uh, as soon as we receive comments from the board and we fully review the comments that were made by members of the R3 group in the community, we can pull the entire um, position announcement together. I don't believe that we will go out to recruitment before the next select board meeting, so a goal could be to have the final draft position announcement done by the next meeting, bring it to the board for one final look over. So if we have any comments, we should... Try to get them to you by the 20th? Yes. A week? A week would be helpful. Yeah. Good deal. Agenda development discussion. So we thought, uh, well, this one line item was, was put up so that we could have uh, some more information shared with, uh, with the board and uh, potentially have a discussion on how we can create the agenda, how it's created, what items are put on the agenda, um, and uh, potentially have a process where members of the board can then speak with me, and then I can then relate to the chair, or just a more formal process for how the agenda is created. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to place this on the agenda now so that the board can talk as a body, as opposed to have individual conversations. Is there any is there any, or are there any questions on how the agenda is created, or uh, any requests on street, mainstreaming the process? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have any right now. Yeah, how many issues? I'm reviewed by the board to make a decision. Uh, I typically will share that with the chair. We communicate and say this is something that we should have on. This is something that's important. Uh, or the chair can then share with me, you know, I've heard from a member of the board, this is something that, that should be on there. Um, so that's typically how the relationship has been working now for how to create the agenda. Um, and if, you know, if there was a change that the board would like to consider or maybe have a more uh, formal process of coming to me and then I go to the chair or just going directly to the chair and then having me pull it together, that's something that I, I think it works great the way it moved right yeah, <laughs> I don't care about most of them. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any issue with it. The only, the only thing I thought of, and I've been talking with um, both Ben and, and Jay about, we're trying to get, you know, we have a lot of information that sometimes comes up from the community when they get to speak, but affording our representatives some time to talk, sometimes, you know, 10 minute brief quarterly that says this is what's, this is what's going on at the state level so we have some more information there because, you know, I. Maybe I should take some more time to be proactive about that, but I'm, I'm not as proactive probably as I should be on that, getting that information. But having them share some of that would be helpful at some okay. period to see, I think. Absolutely. Okay. Um, to, th to that point, I recently started pulling together a, um, a general update from the town of some of the accomplishments, some of the challenges that we're facing, some of the help that we could potentially need from our reps, uh, sending that to them in an email uh, so the first one just went out uh, earlier this week with the caveat of we need help with this one item, help us. But um, to that point, we could also um, continue to share periodic updates with our state representatives and say this is the great stuff we're doing, we could use help here. Oh, and by the way, every quarter you're welcome to, we have a reserve spot for you to come and speak to the select board and the Randolph community. Thank you. Um, and this agenda development discussion can also be a time where Adolfo, you, have a chance to discuss issues that you think the select board should be involved in, right? Like things that you might be hearing from individual members over a period of time, 
instead of having individual conversations, it can be a chance for us all to sort of weigh in together so that if there's questions about that you have about how you're getting guidance from the board for, issue, for, for issues that you think are important for you to get guidance about, that we have an opportunity to do that. Yeah, okay. be helpful. Do you have anything currently going on that we should be talking about then? Uh, well, we have the Maple Street project, but that was something that I was open to, to the, for the manager's report. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a existing conversation with the swimming pool. That was another project that we had going on. That's something that we could certainly continue the conversation on. We've already discussed it, or the board's already discussed it. But I could always bring it back. Uh, as far as I'm aware, those are the only things. That, pretty sure I'm forgetting something, but off the top of my head, those are the only things that stick out at the moment. Okay. Next, we have the review of the personnel policy. The uh, staff are sharing this with the board because we are actively working to make improvements. It is, uh, it has some bearing with our current negotiation with the International Union of Public Employees. Um, we are not able to share too much because of the rules that we had agreed to uh, with the negotiation process, but there are a few items in the personnel policy that uh, are dependent on, well, vice versa. Some of the items in the contract will be dependent on some of the items uh, within the personnel policy. Um, much of the work that has been done uh, to this point within the personnel policy is to just mainstream things. Bring the uh, personnel policy up to date. Um, we had the previous, uh, well, we had a very outdated list of uh, select board members in the policy itself. Um, things like that have been changed. We would like to also create what we will have to create, uh, which is not in this packet that you have now, but will be presented to you in the future, is a um, domestic partner policy that's also part of the negotiation process. So um, there are just items in the personal policy we'd like to have your input on. Uh, and if the board would like, uh, if Trina, if you're okay with it, if the board could potentially share if they have any input at all into the changes that we've proposed, maybe giving it to his staff by the 20th of September, same deadline. I'm just encouraged to see my comments were I mean, yeah. <laughs> no homework. Can you expand uh, page nine, uh, reasonable suspicion, this is in drug and alcohol testing? Or to use this, there's special training required for BLCT, that's special training to determine if there's reasonable suspicion? Yes, there, there is special training that is available to help determine whether there's reasonable suspicion of consumption of alcohol or drugs. Um, we have, the changes that we have implemented have been reviewed by BLCT, not yet by our attorney, but would be, um, before sharing this with our attorney and incurring costs, we wanted to make sure we had the board's input first and then sharing it with our attorney uh, for one final legal overview. But more specifically to your point, yes, there, there are specific trainings that are available through VLCT, this one being one of them. Um, it would make it very challenging to have someone on staff to go through this process and then have them determine hey, you know, that person's been drinking or now that marijuana is legal, you know, that person's been smoking and is under the influence. So there's still some issues with the way uh, things are operating with VLCT and with our personnel policy. Where do we cover part-time elected employees? Uh, I don't think we do. Is there a reason we don't? Uh, good question. I haven't checked with UOCT about part-time elected employees. Because it looks like we specifically added the word full-time. So We did that because we currently do have full-time elected uh, employees. And, and many more part-time elected employees. Right. And so the 
challenge that we're facing, and I, this is something I'd have to look into, but I believe there had been a previous agreement with one of our elected part-time employees to allow them to extend to be more closer to full-time. Um, I'd have to double check that specifically. Is there specific direction you'd like us to go in with that? I just think we have a lot of part-time elected employees that we should have policies that cover them or yeah. include them in this. Yeah. Um, I'm not disagreeing. I, 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 I'm just, I, there may be a potential issue in that because they're elected, they wouldn't necessarily fall under the policy, even though they, there is language in the policy to cover them as an employee. Um, I believe there would be an issue because they're elected, they ultimately would be responsible for the, the voters. I'm not saying that that's, that could be it, but you're right, you know, I could certainly reach out to, to our attorney. And well, I just think it. that a lister is a part-time employee who could go into somebody's house and if they're violating any of these policies, that could be a detriment to the town. Yeah. Sure. No, it's, it's a good point. Are we uh, now requiring direct deposit of all employees? We are working toward that, yeah. <laughs> I see it in there. They're paid bi-weekly via direct deposit. It doesn't give an option. Uh, yeah. No yeah. <laughs> more running in here at 7.55 on Friday morning to sign up for the guys who are here at 7.56 mm -hmm. to get their paycheck. The day before because they're on vacation the next day. Yeah. Um, page 11, um, some of the added text, compulsory time A, I think that's a little bit ambiguous. Um, I don't know if we're looking for comments in real time page here, but one. page 11, under compulsory time A, that can either be read as you can't accrue more than 80 total in a year, but if I accrue 80, use four, I can't accrue anymore, right? Or it so could be... So if you're here five years, you can have 400 hours? No, you can accrue 80 hours in the year, and that's it. Even you use 10, you can't accrue 10 more. You can't accrue 10 more. Okay. Yeah. And so I assume the other. That gets paid out as cash time. That's time and a half? Yeah. yeah. Comp time is time and a half, too. So that's not a summation of what they can carry at any one time. It's a summation for the annual. And at the end of the year, they get paid anything they haven't used. But if I okay, so if I get eighty, use twenty, I can't. I can't go back up to eighty again within that fiscal mm -hmm. year. December thirty first, we'll pay you sixty. Okay. Hmm. Um. I, I, with the understanding that a lot of the language in here is going into very specifics and the nuances, we wanted to make sure that we share this with the board sooner rather than later and just give you time to review and take a look. Yeah. If you're going to be on a flight, and you can read it on the flight. When do you want to comment? It's 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully by the 20th, if possible. Uh, we do have an upcoming uh, labor meeting. Um, I don't believe that we will have a full agreement on contract by then. So um, the personnel policy issues that are being changed in, the, in compliance with that contract uh, have a sunset or a deadline of whenever we sign the contract. So, we next we have the grant agreement for dynamics. We finally received. Uh, the grant agreement, the final grant agreement from, uh, from the state. Uh, they are asking that the select board uh, approve accepting the million dollar grant. Uh, that will be essentially a pass through to the LED dynamic project. Uh, in addition to accepting the grant, there is also a resolution 
that is uh, required uh, that essentially states the fact that the town is accepting the million dollar grant. They're authorizing Two Rivers Art of Quiche, the Regional Planning Commission, to perform the administrative duties, uh, many of the administrative duties, and then authorizing the town manager to act as uh, the agent for the town in signing documents. Does this have any impact on the right of way for the water and lines and all that stuff that we talked about uh, previously? Well, it's, a, it's a, still a bigger part of that, the process. This would just continue to fund the project with the understanding that Green Mountain Economic is still working to resolve some of the water issues and the, the road issues. My understanding is that they are actively seeking funds to correct the line of sight from exiting of the, of the entire complex down to the gap on Greenville Road, the culvert area. So this project, this, these funds are essentially just to continue the project and have the contractors reimbursed uh, with the understanding that Green Mountain Economic has committed to finding additional funds or fundraising for amending this agreement later on and coming to the board for more money to shave that portion of Greenville Road, literally shave uh, the crown of Beanville Road, so we could have a better line of sight down into the culvert. But they walked away from trying to turn the water main and stuff over. Back over the town. Okay, yeah. that's what I was asking. Oh, about. oh, oh it's sorry. different. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 And, and they just paid him. Okay. A lot of issues. Sorry, I'm confused. No, sorry. <laughs> water. Oh, yeah. Water. So I can see we had talks about the other. <laughs> Concerns over this one? Questions? No. And this is for giving you authority to sign, right? Uh, well, if the board were to choose uh, to approve it, it would be a motion to approve or accepting the grant agreement form and then also accepting the resolution that is attached to the grant agreement. So moved. I'll second that. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the, I should mention the resolution sheet that is in your packet is in the signature warrant folder in here, so it's already in there. Next, we have the FEMA subgrant. This is part of a, a long running process between the town, the state, and FEMA. We have been working to try to recoup losses, uh, mostly in terms of staff time and resources and cleaning up uh, debris that flew all throughout the town uh, during our windstorms late last year, uh, when it rained. So we have two uh, grants that are pending, oh, well, one now. This is the one that FEMA has approved, has sent over to the state, and now the state is issuing to the town. Uh, in the form of uh, compensation for staff time and resources spent in clearing up our debris. We did participate in what is called administrative costs. It was something that was, I believe, new this year that allowed the town to not just recoup the, the lost time for salaries of uh, the laborers out in the field, equipment, hours used for idling the trucks, but also to be able to recoup time for administrative costs for uh, our staffer uh, in the grants compliance office as well as my time and having all the meetings with FEMA in the state. So that is not as high an amount as the initial recuperation of 5000 but it is an additional $270. In their scope of work, does that include the budget, but in the actual grant, there's no money. Yeah, they list zero in terms of the actual grant that's being given to us, but uh, on page, there's no page numbers, but on this, uh, would be one, two, three, four, on the, the sixth page, 
Yeah, it gives a total cost of $5,400 and change. And on the final page in the end, it gives a total cost of $270. So it have to be in the have to check. You can accept it. Just make sure that they fix the- To fix the amounts. The allocation yeah. amounts for okay. you before it gets so this one was a motion to accept it and to authorize you as signature? Yes, please. Make a motion we accept and authorize it off the sign. I should prove with the verification of the amounts in the grant. Opposed, abstain to motion carries. Transportation alternatives grant. The state has um, opened transportation alternative grant process. Um, we are working on identifying projects that could potentially fit the, uh, the scope of the grant. Um, we would like to have the select board authorize us to not only look for these projects, but potentially apply for the project that best fits um, the requirements, uh, which is why we place that item on the agenda. But before we do apply, we would like to mention that we're going to make sure that if the project, if we're going to propose a project, it's not going to set us back too far with any future projects that would better be served by a grant money. Is this the one you're looking at the self -fed? Uh, I sent you. Yeah, it's the one you sent me. Yeah. But we could potentially not do the salt shed, try to extend that life a little longer and find some other stormwater mitigation project. to allow you to apply for a transportation alternative grants? Yes, please. That's my motion. Second. Those <laughs> <laughs> in Thanks, favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying motion carries. Well, business. Yeah. The local, operate, local emergency operations plan is something that we have to file with our regional planning commission. Um, uh, staff and I have been working to try to update the plan as much as possible. We've had the clerk treasurer's office look over some of the sensitive sites that are listed in the plan to make sure that sites remain uh, active. Uh, we've added a few items to the sensitive um, uh, location sites, including a child care center and a private home. We've updated the contact information for uh, emergency personnel, including our new uh, fire chiefs and then also our new law enforcement representatives. Um, this is, what you're looking at is the base plan. It's essentially the only portion of the local emergency operation plan that is required to be submitted to a regional planning commission. There are other appendices that we can continue to work on to augment it, which includes mutual aid to other towns and vice versa. Uh, that is a more lengthy process. So um, in order to continue to bog down the process to get those uh, MOUs into place, I thought it'd be best to just get what's necessary to our Regional Planning Commission and continue to work to have those appendices completed later. We have, over the last several months, uh, received full inventories of uh, equipment that is available in our fire departments and also police departments, so much of the information in here is fully updated as of this year.
course, the board has to adopt it before it goes there. That's right. So uh, page eight, the planning task number five. So just trying to make sure I understand. So it's a primary and secondary, I assume, for PNS. That's right. So select board has the primary responsibility for floods. I went back and forth on that one. Um, much of it is pre-planning for floods, just to, you know, if we have a rainstorm that's coming out, we know where we typically have flip lane areas. So we would work with our town engineer, with staff to identify those areas. Um, we will have fire and law enforcement personnel on site when it actually happens. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I feel historically I've been listed as a select board in advance knowing what floods could be. Um, but it is something that we could change. I was just curious. I didn't, I didn't consider the planning side of it, I guess. And I think the power out is what makes sense. Although I've never seen them at 2 in the morning. <laughs> power out? Yeah. No. Oh. The public works out there with us. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, a public gathering, wouldn't law happen. enforcement be a primary and not a second? When are they? You guys go out. Uh, because this is essentially right. not an approval process. This would be after the no, 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 just a public bigger. gathering became an emergency. Right. Uh, be it could be. Uh, could be. I'm trying there. to get to that point. Uh, law enforcement. Yeah, there you have it listed as secondary. But you're right, it could be. they could be primary. Which one's that mean? Uh, public gatherings. Public gatherings. Personal. If it's becoming a type of disaster, I think it's after the fact that we've seen it, and so we right. probably wouldn't be a primary for that. It'd probably be law enforcement. Also, I'm not sure Jim and Barb Townsend still own the fuel tanks. I thought he retired and they were done with it. Okay. Um, that's on page five. Page five. Ferret or bolt tanks. Oh yeah, I think those are owned by lights now. Yeah, I think he bought the entire business. I think that's right. Uh, Maybe uh, Jim and Barb still own the tanks, but. Uh, no, down here. Right there. I'm not sure they're, oh. they're still the owners of those. Okay. Oh, you think White's bought that? They did. So. Yeah. And I know they took over the business. Well, yeah, sorry. They did take over. So I have two changes. One on page A for primary response to law enforcement. The public gathering is on page five to confirm ownership of uh, the site at Six Fold Street. I guess another quick question: the new new fire department operation center, but not a not a shelter. I spoke with Jay about that. Um, in terms of shelter, I mean, there's a kitchen, but we don't have, my understanding, like the cots. There's no cots right there. Yeah. So we didn't list them as a, you know, 
potential overnight shelter or things of that nature. I did list the ones that we had before after confirming with my VTC in those places of the so, cots. Yeah. So the high school has the cots stored there? Uh, they said that they have the equipment for that, yeah. I don't think they do. I don't think they do either. Okay. Wes? Uh, Wes or Bob? Bob Worthy? Yeah, I think he works with Wes. Um, it confirmed that they had overnight shelter supplies, but I could check with them again. Yeah, and I thought, I'd just be surprised I thought they the Red Cross had provided Judd's. Yeah. And that DTC actually didn't have them. I, I know when we talked, we were in the planning phases for the fire department, that was definitely something that was communicated, talked about. I didn't know okay. what the final decision was. So. Okay. But yes. it may be another opportunity. For the third item, check with uh, Bob and Wes. So we confirm shelter supplies. And I guess if cots are a requirement, are we prepared with those as a town perspective? Yeah. No. In this space? I'll go up there. <laughs> Old dorm. <laughs> Do you have any motion on that tonight? Uh, to accept it with those changes? If the board would you know, make a motion to accept with confirmation of these changes, that would be ideal. Then I could make those changes if necessary and <coughs> submit to to Ruth. I move that we accept the local emergency operations plan with the changes as we discussed. Aye. 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 We don't have any representatives from, or any of our three representatives, DC Fiber. Um, we sent an invitation, we received one reply, um, and also a personal visit from, from uh, Jerry Ward, one of our, I believe our second alternate. Um, the conversation revolved around the need to have both the Ready District and also um, EC Fibers presence. Um, what spurred that invitation was a previous conversation that I had had for Paul Haskell's request to speak with um, Paul Giuliani, the attorney that has worked with EC Fiber, and gotten that group to where they are now. Uh, in my conversation with Paul Giuliani, it was ex a concern was expressed in having two groups with the same mission in town. Um, he was not opposed to a ready district, but had expressed serious concerns with having a ready district uh, unless there was a letter of support or some kind of support issued by EC Fiber. Um, so we left the conversation at that point. I reached out to Paul Haskell. He confirmed that EC Fiber would not support a ready district. I then reached out to EC Fiber, our representatives to EC Fiber, and they confirmed that uh, the reason for potential, why a potential ready district uh, is being proposed to the board is because EC Fiber has prioritized other areas that are now being proposed in the ready district, which includes Stock Farm Road, East Bethel Road, Official Road neighborhood. So I have yet to speak with Paul Haskell again after having these conversations, but. Uh, my sense is that a ready district is being proposed because of a frustration with EC Fiber for not prioritizing this particular neighborhood. Um, and so that's that's where we are now with, with the ready district and EC Fiber. So just to make sure I understand you, you're saying that EC Fiber is now saying that those areas are high priority areas for them to cover? No, they... There is a group that's lobbying EC Fiber to make those areas high priority. Okay. Uh, EC Fiber is, they, they have not said that those areas are not high priority, but they have said that other areas are high priority. Okay. And so money is being diverted to other areas throughout the state. Uh, our, our group in town feels that that would be a priority, has made it publicly known to EC Fiber that it would be a good idea to extend services to East Bethel, Stock Farm Road, Fishel Road. 
Um, their request has not been fulfilled, which I believe is what spurred this sense of frustration with now there's this opportunity with a ready district, let's move forward with it to get what we want in that neighborhood. Um, but that mission and that that movement could be counter to what EC5 is working on at the moment. So why couldn't they bid it out in EC5 right. and win it? And basically they're subsidizing EC fibers expansion. Similar that they were gonna do with EC fiber still has to go through the permitting process to get onto the pole. Right. That's the and they're difference. claiming that's what drags it out. Whereas these guys are claiming basically bidding it out is to who has wire on the pole already. Mm -hmm. Is what they're looking for, which is one company. Which is probably why they're only able to talk to consolidated. Right, but that's just time then. Right. Which is why they're having EC fiber service is time also. And then they don't want to wait that time. They wanna create this district. And the mm -hmm. concern, if I understood it correctly, is that creating a bunch of these is gonna undermine the whole pyramid that's set up that basically makes EC fiber work. Yeah. I thought EC Fiber was sort of self-sustaining as it was going along. But they're not counting on additional built-out areas for to, to, to guarantee a future business model. If that's the case, I'm not sure why they're so concerned about this district being formed then. Because they want the money eventually, maybe? I don't know. To me, I've been I've been meeting with some teachers, um, and a lot of the themes that I'm hearing from the local, you know, the teachers of the school systems is, hey, look, we're ten years behind mm -hmm. um, on some of the stuff we're able to do because they can't assign online homework or math problems online to a class because some portion of that class can't get online. So they're really looking for solutions to to you know uh, to help them out, and so whatever we can do to get high speed internet or some mm -hmm. some better form of internet to the folks in the rural areas of our of our community is super important I think. Sure. Um, and I think it's gonna make some of our, you know, our classrooms more attractive, our schools more attractive and and also benefit our young people for sure. And I don't know how that works yeah. with this whole political and or money or pyramid or whatever it may be. But concerned enough to show up is it how big the concern is it? Mm -hmm. you know, there was three of them, and not one of them could make it here tonight to tonight. try to explain what their concern is. They being our three appointed oh, reps to the EC Fiber board. Oh, the EC Fiber folks. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you meant Reddy or EC Fiber. Oh, Reddy's not here either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Point How taken. important is that to them? <clears throat> I mean,. It sounds like things might be changing, but you know the track record for EC Fiber is that it takes a really long time for service to happen. So if someone says we can form a ready district and they can actually make it happen in a short period of time and it saves years for those people to get online with a reasonable connection. Yeah, but we're I'm not sure I want to stand in their way. Months, and it's because of funding. So they got to get permission to get on the polls after they get the funding. So if this district's going to uh, provide the funding. Now it's just a few months to get permission to go on the polls. Yeah. That's a totally and, different estimate. And DC fiber scheduling, right? I mean, they've got, if they have some plan, some layout that they're working, I don't know how much of an impact would be for them to change that and modify it, whatever it is. Well, just you know, be in addition to it, wouldn't be changing it. But if they're promised areas, you know, hey, you're going to get here, you're going to get here, you, then all of a sudden that district goes, or that area goes to the end of the list still. I don't know. Yeah, but I think it supplements their plan, not. Could be, could be they add staff and they hire more crews and they can get twice as much work done. I don't know, but. They hire all their work done anyway. Yeah, I, th I think they're hiring. I, I don't think there's much staff there. Because they do it all contracted. I don't know. I just know from a from a from a housing perspective, from an education perspective, it's definitely a excuse me a whole. It's, it's certainly one of the topics that comes up over and over again is getting high-speed access to every corner of our of our region as fast as we can.
So who, who approves and adopts the bylaws, us or them? Or the Ready District? I, there was some confusion with the way it worked. Because uh, my understanding is that the only involvement from the select board in the Ready District is appointing representatives to the district. And then the connection ended. Um, I haven't looked into how the actual bylaws are created. We, well, we create the Ready District, yeah. right? We give the existence of the boundaries. The authority yeah. to, to, uh, to exist. I just wonder if we can do it so that they have to go out and competitively select. Can we put something in their bylaws that require them to competitively select who they Three quotes. work with? <laughs> <laughs> That's a town purchasing policy. Well, it's over federal government and purchase permits everything. Yeah, for any sort of government, yeah. Sometimes Three we're shaking them out of the trees to give us a zero quote. Not right. interested, just so we can say we got three. Yeah, it's been a problem on, on federally funded projects with WBEs and DBEs getting people to bid. Yeah. <clears throat> so if the board would like it, continue working on the process, um, find answers to the creation of the bylaws, understand how, um, if the board would choose to create a ready district, how it would either work with or directly conflict with or what it relation, its relationship would be with EC Fiber. And then I could report back and then give an opportunity to our EC Fiber reps and Paul to come back and speak from their perspective again. If we can't get our reps to do it, we may have to go to the, the actual board. Yeah, executive director or manager or whoever it is, yeah. EC Fiber to get somebody. Yeah. The big question being, why can't they do it? If this group can raise the money, why can't EC Fiber get in there and do the install? Yeah. Especially since they could then carry it through to other people at the other ends of this district. And, yeah. and our reps to EC Fiber, those are people who are acting in the best interest of the town, right, as our representatives. So they're <clears throat> not necessarily people who are representing EC Fiber to us thinking, trying to protect that as an organization. Right? Right. So that might be why we're not seeing them showing up. The latter would be why? Just that they're, they're, they might, maybe they all think, maybe our reps think, yeah, Ready District would be fine, even though they're the reps to the EC Fiber, maybe they, but they think, oh yeah, so EC Fiber is taking a long time, so. Maybe the town really should pursue other avenues, if at all possible. They have no, they have no objection to this process. Mm -hmm. EC Fiber itself might. I do know that two of our three reps are connected in a certain way. Um, some in ways that you know, they would choose to not share in public um, just yet. I, you know, not to me to release their news, but I, I think you're right in that there are issues there. there they're not entirely uh, opposed to it, but they're, you know, we're in Randolph. And our representatives know the Ready District interested party, and so there's, there's a relationship there. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank More people get competing for this, the better, as far as I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard for me to see a downside for the town. I'll report back with more at the next meeting. Contract with Orange County Sheriff's. Uh, we have, have received it. What is that, Julie? I said we haven't hit the right one yet. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, received notice um, from our Randolph Police Department officer, the sole remaining officer, that he will leave uh, or has resigned his position uh, effective as of September 16th. So that will leave the Randolph Police Department with no police officers. Um, I would like to request that the board authorize me to amend the existing agreement with Orange County Sheriff's Department to uh, include an additional 40-hour shift 
uh, at the same existing rate of $46 per hour so that we could cover all of the shifts, uh, the ones that will be, at the very least, the ones that will be no longer coverable by our departing police officer. Make a motion we adopt the police district Orange County Sheriff contract to add 40 hours at the rate of 40, 40 hours per week at the rate of $46 per hour. Second. Amend or adopt? Amend? Yeah. What did I say? Adopt. Amend, amend. <laughs> I think you heard me wrong. <laughs> Let's rewind the tape. <laughs> motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Tax anticipation agreement. This is part of the uh, continuation of a tax anticipation note that the select board has previously approved. The bank has returned and asked that we have the appropriate agreement documents signed, which are in the uh, in the warrant folder that will be circulated before the end of the meeting. It's just confirming that the select board has authorized town to apply for a million dollar tax anticipation note. Uh, we will also share with them minutes um, of formal meeting saying that the board has authorized it and now we're going to have signatures to go along with the actual paperwork for the million dollar tax anticipation note. Uh, and don't just, need any further motions or anything? No like further that, right? motions. Right. Just signing? Just signing. Great. Other business. We have a dry hydrant grant. Yes, we received the dry hydro grant from uh, uh, one of our community members, Troy uh, Dare. Uh, if the board continues to uh, support the dry hydro pass through grant, um, you know, the board can motion for the town to accept the grant. Is this the repairs? This is for the repairs. And where? I'm sorry. This is a dry hydrant that malfunctioned to be installed near uh, oh, the Silway Road. Silway Road. Blue Goose. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, so the town will not lose out on any money. We, it would be paid for by the person that installed it. They just wanted us to help. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Make a motion we accept the fire hydrant. Dry hydrant grant application, is it? It's a grant no, application. Oh, grant, grant. Uh, to accept the, the grant agreement. Grant uh, agreement. Uh, award. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. <coughs> we have any other, other business? We have uh, the manager's report, and I have a feeling we have an audience for the manager's report. So at least one item on it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But I was going to say, they came, they, before we move on, they came yeah. in late. Was there a specific <laughs> item that you folks came in for? We just got done with another meeting and we just got civic pride. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's bubbling over, I can tell. <laughs> and you didn't bring coffee? <laughs> there, well, are, there are muffins. <laughs> yeah, there are muffins. There are muffins. <laughs> there are muffins. Okay. So, um, one of the items on my manager's report actually uh, works well with three of our attendees tonight. It is, um, conversations that I've had with members of the Conservation Commission. Um, the, con the commission has requested that we could potentially reestablish a, um, a select board liaison to the Conservation Commission to have a more of a strong connection. Um, I know we've had this, you know, we've had this request relate to the board in the past. Um, I've continued to work with Michael and attempted to attend the last meeting, uh, but I think it was no quorum? I don't think that would happen. Yeah, that's what we're asking. About an hour uh, and a half ago. Yeah, oh, again? This, okay, yeah. uh, for the second one. Uh, so you want us to come? <laughs> <laughs> we won't. We don't count. <laughs> yeah. So that is, uh, uh, that was a request from the Conservation Commission in addition to the request for the uh, EAB report, the Emerald Ash Pour. Uh, report that had been uh, spearheaded by the Conservation Commission. So I'm going to uh, make more of a point to work with Michael, to work with the Commission to review the report itself, become more familiar before bringing it back to the board for recommendations and actions. So, um, so 
see. I did share information with them. <laughs> the part that was missing on that was um, like a recommended plan. What? Because it went from zero to a million dollars, right? We could do nothing or we could give you a million bucks. That well, I think that, I so, think, yeah, my impression of it is that it's the kind of thing that um, needs a, some kind of subcommittee or organization to decide what to do with it like it's a it's a pest management plan specifically for this forest pest of uh, the emerald ash borer that is not prescriptive but it provides op options and lays out some of the pros and cons of those options and leaves it up to a group of town decision makers to decide you know what we want, you know, people with the purse strings probably to decide how do we want to mitigate this risk and what we want to do with it. So it's a management plan. It's not a prescriptive step by step, you must do this kind of plan. I believe when we had the last presentation, Erica. It was looking to accept the plan and move into action on it. I think the last it was time was when I came, that was last June. And there were certain recommendations. There were options and then there were recommendations. One thing being establish a budget for some tree removal. And, and that is, you know, the, and, and the plan offers amounts from zero to, like, like you said, a huge amount. But it's up to town planners or you all to kind of decide how much, how far you want to go, and how much of the budget you want to create for it. Um, but there's some other steps to take also, like just having like a, a place to put debris once it starts coming down. You know, where's that going to be? Where's that area going to be? Is it going to be in, com in combination with another town, like you know, with Green Tree or another town to? Have a common area, um, but the idea being um, not only mitigating the effects of the of the pest, but but perhaps even more importantly, preventing you know future extreme um, costs due to like weather when these trees that are dying and you have a windstorm and all of a sudden you've got tons of limbs and roads that require a lot of town employees and um, action to be taken that if limbs had been taken down ahead of time or trees that were half dead ahead of time or in a you know, step by step process throughout the next few years, few years, um, or working with um, the electric company, finding out how, what they'll take down, um, just to kind of have some thought ahead of time for what kinds of things we can expect. I think the issue is basically you're going to have to deal with it now or you're going to have to deal with not having dealt with it now later. And we just wanted to make sure it's in front of you guys because we can't make decisions we can only recommend. But at least you know what things to think about and maybe partnerships you can create now so that you know we know it's in Orange County. And so mm -hmm. now it's a little bit more urgent maybe than when we were talking. Yeah, and if, it, and if it doesn't feel like it's, a, it's at a boiling point yet, like unfortunately at some point it probably will feel like, okay, this is like an urgent thing that we need to deal with. And if there's questions, you know, in the town management about like how to handle this, the management plan is meant to be a resource to look to, to tell you, okay, these are the kinds of things that you might want to consider and make decisions about. It doesn't tell you do this, do that, do this. Tells you like these are the kinds of things that you may consider doing, and it's available on the website on our page for landowners who may want to step in right now and deal with whatever their situation is on the woodlots. Mm -hmm. well, just cutting. <clears throat> There's a mass cutting of ash in Vermont right now, which is what the state told them not to do. Not to do, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and with lots is different than regular right? so, mm -hmm. um, But if the plans 
supposed to help landowners too. It's a lot of them are just in the woods. Right. A lot of furniture and that's going to be made over the next few years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and as I recall, like some of that information was sort of late in coming to or really recent that they realized that some of the native ash population is showing some res resistance because uh, like when the Conservation Commission was first approached by the state and had presentations you know from the s supposed experts we were initially informed that it didn't that you you may as well cut everything because there in Michigan and these other places there had been no uh, natural resistance shown and in recent months and years I guess um, real recently they found that there actually is so some of that information changes over time as well are which we doesn't have, help <laughs> we have better woodpeckers up here than they do. maybe that's it yeah. <laughs> more aggressive that's what the best thing is I guess huh they'll eat them I think they have a 90 percent success no rate with woodpeckers yeah hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, guys. Um, a, a different conversation that I had also, the Conservation Commission has been all over my radar. And another conversation I had with Michael, uh, the chair for the committee, uh, related to interchanging of information from our different committees and commissions, and, which spurred the thought of uh, two new committees that I was hoping to share with the board at some point to potentially create. Uh, the first is more germane to the Conservation Commission uh, conversation that I had, and that's to create a committee's chair, a committee chair's committee, and this would be once a quarter. Uh, all the committee chairs could come in and share about the work that they're doing, so if one committee's doing one thing, um, that helps with the other committee that could kind of work together, or at the very least keep each other informed of what's going on. So if there are ways so they can partner with each other, they could. Um, the thought is more information sharing, the better, and it's only a quarterly meeting as opposed to a monthly meeting. Um, the other committee that I was hoping to get some input at some point would be uh, an Arts and Culture Commission or Arts and Culture Committee, try to tap into the arts community that we have here in Randolph. Um, potentially also use them as a potential uh, grant application source of so their uh, arts related grants that we could apply for and staff just don't have capacity to apply for them we could go to our committee and say this would be a good grant that we could apply for for whatever reason um, but mostly it's just to tap in into the arts community that we have in Randolph but I know it's a strong community we just don't have much involved uh, involvement with them at the time um, got a long laundry list so please bear with me uh, lots going on uh, one of the major things that uh, I would like to share with you is a very visible item and it's our town report. Um, I brought some samples with us to take a look at and the samples are here because of an issue that we had with our order for last year's, for this current year's town report. Um, we ordered 800 and approximately 63 versions of this town report. Um, we had reports of the books falling apart. Uh, what was happening is folks were just doing normal use, were opening them up, it would crack in the spine and the pages started coming out. Um, we've since learned that the company, company said to us that they've apologized. Uh, they didn't use as much glue as they would have needed. Um, so they've offered to us this spiral bound uh, town report. Um, and if the select board and the town were to go back to them this year, they would offer this more expensive version at no increase in cost. So they're essentially giving us a $500 and change credit. Um, if we do go back to this version, it would be $500 cheaper than it was this year, uh, which already was 50% cheaper than the previous year because we had gone with a different company through an RFP process. So, uh, I brought these examples to see if the board likes the spiral bound uh, version. Staff have reviewed them, they like it. It's just easier to open up and no spine to break. So I brought those to take a look. So the non-spiral one, $500 cheaper this year than last year, they're going to give a discount, a right. credit? Yeah. Well, essentially Will they use more glue? They time? would use more glue. Yeah. I did say to them that, you know, if the board, because this became a, community, a problem with the community, if the board said, fine, let's go with the one we had, it would be $500 cheaper or a non-ring binder, and then the books fell apart again, then, you know, there would be a bigger issue with the community because it happened again. So, um, 
if staff were to make a recommendation at cost neutral, if we were to go with the spiral bound uh, version, I think it would be well accepted by the community. We wouldn't have breaking spine issues or pages coming out. Um, and it would be a cost neutral again, but even if we chose to go with it next year, it is roughly about five or $600 more uh, than this version of it, uh, or the one underneath it, sorry. But even still, it is still roughly about $1,000 less than we had been paying before. So we're still at a savings. How many complaints did we get with the pages falling out? I had two or three, um, but there were also issues that I, I think complaints were being made to other people. People were talking and they just didn't get back to me. So I just thought it was two or three. Uh, mine did also fall apart and I thought, okay, if I only heard from three people in my book out of 863, Maybe we were just the only three or four books that fell apart, but apparently it had been a much broader, bigger issue. Mine so. fell apart too. But, did it not <laughs> go oh. but you're saying that these weren't, basically weren't printed properly. Like they should have been, they shouldn't have fallen apart. That's right. So in the future, we can save $500 and get books that work the way they're supposed to and then it'll just be like it's always been and it'll yeah. be fine. Yep. Right? It's still five hundred dollars. Okay. I, I just brought it just to share the options of the books and if the board likes the spiral, you know, it's still overall it's still a, a savings from the previous contract that we had. So uh, I just brought them as examples if you like them. Uh, you know it doesn't fall apart? PDFs. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Gotta get everybody internet. Yeah. 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 It's it's be cheaper to hand out a thumb drive. It would uh, be. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. A general <laughs> lesson. <laughs> <laughs> a general a thumb, a thumb drive that would hold this is, is essentially free. That's true. Much cheaper. We'll buy them in bulk, put our logo I'll on donate them. Donate them. Yeah. We have uh, just a general update on the ad hoc police district. Um, evaluation committee. We have our next meeting scheduled for October 12th um, with a also a, uh, I'm sorry, no. The date is October 12th. is October a public Public meeting. hearing. September 20th is the next meeting. That's, I think that's right. Yeah, September yeah. 20th. September 20th is the next meeting. That would be meeting number three uh, with a planned public hearing slash listening session uh, for October 12th. And we plan to start advertising for tomorrow. Uh, the process is moving along well. We've had members ask a lot of questions and have been remain have remained involved in the process. Um, we have uh, a proposal at some point. The initial stages of a proposal to reconfigure the intersection of Beanville Road and Route 12 just to make it more commercial truck traffic friendly. Um, currently, there is just a severe angle that prevents trucks traveling southbound on 12 to make a left onto Beanville Road, which could be leading to the increase in commercial traffic on Maple Street and Highland Street as it cut over to South Pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, so as we work on the Maple Street project, which I will uh, talk about briefly or shortly, um, we also are considering improvements to that intersection in addition to trying to reduce the, the dip on South Pleasant Street as it travels southbound uh, right by the railroad tracks. Because that's also a place where trucks don't like to go because it, they have to slow down for the bump and then speed up again. Mm. So it makes it a problem for them to and take those two routes. Out, make it more like Main Street, which is a pretty nice exactly. yeah. crossing there. So there, there, there are potential issues there that we're gonna have to deal with, but for the most part, that you know, we're initial conversations for that. Um, we have established or reestablished conversations with the New England Central Rail uh, regarding Railroad Street. Uh, they've sent to me an agreement that would allow the town to not take possession but to lease Railroad Street so that we could then maintain it, fix the road, make it more to a class three standard. Uh, I've expressed concern to the railroad saying, I don't believe we need to pay you $365 a year to allow us to improve your property and do all these things and then it's also install a guardrail because they're insisting that we install a guardrail and a few other items. So they're open to having a conversation, they're open to continuing the conversation with the town, but they 
are insisting that they be allowed to remove themselves from an agreement within 30 days, regardless of whatever investment we've made into Railroad Street. Um, and they also will require us to install a, a guardrail so that any snow plow, plow operation won't cause snow to go onto the track. I reminded them that you know there's no guardrail there now and cars are using it. Uh, I took photos and sent them to them of the condition of the road, but they're holding firm. So. Um, the guardrail piece has been in the conversation from the get-go, even a few years ago when we were dealing with it and all this year. Mm -hmm. They've always been pretty. So who's plowing it now? There's private landowners? Last year it wasn't plowed at all. It wasn't plowed at all? No, which added to the frustration. Because there was the a huge was. pile of snow in the middle right. yeah. of the road, so someone plowed it to that pile. Like, yeah. they plowed the road up. To, to make that Giles and, and uh, the real estate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to say that the town didn't plow it. Right, right. Yeah, right. there could have been private prices. So is Railroad Street from Maine back to Pleasant? I mean, is that the whole thing? Is it the entirety? It's the entirety of it, yeah. And that's the side where, uh, where Al's Pizza is. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I just didn't know if they owned, they owned from the back of Al's Park lot to the, you know, a certain, or if it was the. It's, yeah, yeah, just the whole entire stretch. Yeah. So. Well, the out is also pretty standard mm -hmm. in the rail agreement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen them exercise it, but it's there. Yeah. They're willing, from my conversation with their representative, they're willing to potentially waive the dollar a day fee for the lease. So, um, you know, at least that's it's a give. So. You know, I'll, I'll continue talking to them. How much They're do we think it costs to, I mean, is it just filling in the potholes of gravel? I mean, to get it to a passable? Uh, or is there like a whole grading thing and sloping and drainage? And, yeah. Yeah. Right now, the water all slopes right towards the building that the real estate folks are in. Yeah. One and of the, the... And in the middle of the pizza place, parking spot. Yeah. It's always a puddle there. Some of those, some of those craters are, literally craters, they're like, Eight, ten inches deep. Yeah, I lost yeah, my truck real once. Lost my truck. <laughs> <laughs> um, it did cost. Uh, it, it, it could bear. It could be an apples to apples situation, but on rail on a furnace road, uh, that project costs over a hundred thousand dollars for that large segment. Well, it, didn't, it was uh, paid for by the state. Uh, uh, that large project was 160,000. Well, not 160, but over 100,000 um, dollars. Taking the same type of work and putting that on Railroad Street um, it could be more costly because it's a smaller road. But you know, if we took just an estimate of the same distance of Railroad Street to the same distance of Furnace Street and say, you know, it costs us 20, 30,000 dollars just to do like a shim and overlay and not dealing with the stormwater, but we would have to deal with stormwater and guardrails. We'll keep working on that. Uh, we talked about the one house roads. Um, we had a change in personnel assignments. The uh, duties of uh, HR director have been uh, reabsorbed by the town manager's office. So now the human resource department is operating on the town manager's office on so performing those duties now. So if you have any questions personnel related, please feel free to come and see me. Uh, Where were they before? So in that policy, uh, it specifically separates town manager from human resources director. Uh, I'd have to take a look, but I know by state statute, the town manager is technically the human resources director, and then also something I don't want to do is the delinquent tax collector. But, <laughs> but I'll revisit that portion of it about human resources. That was a relatively new thing that happened, so it could have were we outsourcing it before? No, they were being performed within uh, our finance department. Uh, oh. So we just felt it was just better to have the duties in the town manager's office. Um, we have a conversation tomorrow with Vermont Emergency Management about a proposed tabletop exercise. Um, I have been sharing information with the fire advisory committee. The committee is open to performing a tabletop exercise and <clears throat> later in 
next year in the spring for conducting a full mobilization exercise. So that's moving along. Uh, we have to have more information soon. We will include Gifford and the Orange County <coughs> School Supervisory District in the exercise just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so that's that. Um, we have um, a meeting scheduled between the town and RACDC. Uh, this would be a gold, uh, a gold setting meeting. Um, I received confirmation from Julie that we have a meeting time and date. So we will be meeting with them very soon to have more mutually agreeable goals as we move forward. Um, and the last thing would be a good thing uh, before speaking about the Maple Street project is the town staff is working on potentially creating a softball team and challenging one of our three fire departments. So any of the select board members would like to play uh, or the members of their family on the town hall staff? Uh, <laughs> make it members of the family, yeah. so make it the kids and the ones that can make it. <laughs> so the, the, who are you taking on? Uh, well, we're hoping to do like a round robin. Well, we play, we play two games. Well, well we're going to have to play a fire department for each one of the games, and then the other three fire departments will play each other. Um, so it'd be a round robin, four teams. Try to make it a family par uh, picnic at one of our local parks. Try to just build camaraderie. So, if we don't all pull something. <laughs> Uh, so if there's any interest in joining the team, please let me know. It's very competitive, so you got to hurry up. <laughs> the tryouts will be Saturday. Try to Saturday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're going to practice for a month. Yeah. And then call the fire department. Exactly. Like, hey, you want to play tomorrow? <laughs> well, I tell you that we only have three members on the team right now, so uh, it's going to be a, a long haul. Uh, the last issue uh, is the Maple Street Project. We recently had a planning meeting yesterday with the Boise King. Um, we reviewed the proposed plan for the project. We understand that there uh, hasn't been a final decision being made yet on the one-way direction for the road. Um, but during the meeting that we had yesterday, we found that there are uh, size constraints that uh, limit our options. Uh, we did recently learn that Green Mountain Power will be able to move the light poles um, within a relatively short amount of time at their expense, which would, um, which is great. Uh, but the actual project itself, um, because it narrows to some, some places down to 17 feet, um, we would prefer to have it one way as opposed to have it in a dual way direction. Um, there are, again, some constraints with size and the width of the road, and this would just make it easier for us to be able to, to have the project. But before we ask the board to make a decision, the, the goal would be, if the board approved, to have a meeting, uh, either a specially warned meeting or even at the next select board meeting where uh, the item is either put on the agenda or a special hearing is held before the board meeting uh, to invite all the members of the Maple Street community, Highland Street, so that they could come in and share their concerns and their views, being that the last time something like this was held, it's been, I think, over, over a year. It's well before I arrived at the town. So this would give them a new opportunity to voice their concerns with traffic um, for the town and select board if the select board were to approve to also potentially include speed tables on Highland to limit uh, speeding on that street or commercial traffic. So um, that's something that we would like to bring to the board at some point for you to consider either a special meeting or a hearing before the next select board meeting. We could definitely would need a decision now. It's under the manager's report, so we wouldn't be able to have them. But <coughs> a conversation that we could have moving forward. Um, but the project itself, we we feel very comfortable with with the relationship that we're going to have with Green Mountain Power and at least the players involved in the, the planning process. Um, and that uh, one last thing we've done this far, might as well. Go the extra mile. <laughs> uh, I alluded to this five. earlier in that we do have our current vacant position with uh, the buildings and grounds director position. Um, we are working on a plan to be able to reorganize the position, break out cemeteries, and have our existing cemetery crews just do the cemeteries 
reclassify our laborer positions to not just be cemetery laborers and parks and rec laborers, but just be laborers for the town. So this way we can move them around wherever we need them. If we need all our laborers at the cemetery, we could send them all over there. Or if parks and recs needs all of the laborers to set up goals or something that they need right away, we could send them all without having to fall under the, well, I'm classified as cemetery, so I'm not leaving the cemetery. Or I'm only classified as parks, I'm not going to help at the cemeteries. That, that'll be a, a much larger process because it's dealing with reclassification of duties. Uh, but on the more immediate front is we're learning that we could potentially do without the position of buildings and grounds director. And if our conversations with Gifford uh, or the school district go well, we could potentially farm out uh, the buildings and grounds duties to their maintenance crews. So they already have a full maintenance crew. They have somebody who supervises them. And our building the ground position would essentially just be someone that we can go to for an immediate problem. Our pipe at City Hall or a town hall broke because we had a plumbing issue. We would go to them and have them work with our contractors to fix it. Or if we have our um, emergency generators that need to be serviced once a year, we can go to them and say, this is the job, this is what you need to do, these are your checklists, you need to do them for us. Um, it's still a, a preliminary conversation, it's still in flux, um, but if the savings that are there and the duties that could be incorporated with the school district maintenance team or Gifford maintenance team, then what I could then do is uh, bring some options to the board and see if we can work something out with, with those agencies. So, uh, and that is it. That's what I have for the manager's report. Okay. That's on the agenda, we have executive session. Um, Pursuant to 1 BSA 313F, Attorney Town Communications.